I was swinging. Cool the motherfucking gang coming to you. First thing on a Thursday morning. It's the Bennington Show. I'm Ron Bennington. There's Gail Bennington. Yo. Uh, and I'm Ron Bennington. Hmm. Cool in the gang, one of the few bands in history ever to sing about going to a Cool in the Gang show. Yeah. Most times people don't <laughs> sing about themselves <laughs> like I went to see myself at a show. Like it's strange enough to drop the name of your band, but then then immediately you go, whose perspective is this from? <laughs> it's, Who uh, are you? That's the thing. Meta. Um, you know, big, big show last night, maybe a comedy Woodstock at the comedy cellar. Listen to the lineup that all popped in. If you happen to be somebody at the cellar, that sits about what? 85, 90, uh, Aziz, David Tell, Chris Rock, Amy Schumer, and Dave Chappelle all did sets last night. This is the exact reason. That it is so worth it to check out what they're up to. Because that happens, like, it's a frequent thing. But yeah. this has to be one of the best of all time. Afterwards, uh, Seinfeld took everybody uh, for a ride and to get coffee. I don't know that why he so did nice. that. so nice. I don't know why he did it. He, he loves to do that. I don't know. One of the, remember the young lady the other night that uh, did this show, that um, the storytelling show? And you dug her and you yeah, talked yeah, to her yeah. after the show. She was there. So she's got. Nice. Uh, Very cool. Joyelle. She called, yeah. yeah. Uh, what's her whole name? Joyelle. I, I can't remember. Joyelle Johnson. 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 Sorry about that. I knew it was a common last name. Just a common person's <laughs> name. But she calls that the Photoshop of all time. Uh, but, you know, she was there. She doesn't have to Photoshop it. <laughs> uh, 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 uh. Uh, so that was a very, very uh, cool scene, and why you should uh, pay attention to what's happening in uh, comedy right now. You know what's really funny is Attell didn't hang around for one picture. Not one. Attell did a set and left. <laughs> like, I really want to go home right now. He's got his own scene. I don't think he even took his coat off when he went on stage. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know what he's got in those pockets. Cigarettes. Uh, Friday, we're doing street jokes. Chris has put together a big, uh, just a bustling show business promo, too. Great. I can't wait to hear I, it. I don't want to hear it, Chris. Okay. Make sure we get a chance to hear it. Pat from Florida has got a little spy report for us. Spy report. Spy report. Pat, hey. what the hell's going hey there, on? Hey Bennington. Yeah. Hey, man. Hey, I saw uh, online where uh, Hooters is doing this new thing now that if you uh, have a tender date or plenty of fish date and... You want to be safe, go to Hooters, and if it's going south, you can go up to the bartender and ask for an angel shot. And what that is, is uh, there's plenty, there's different series. If it's going really bad, they can go as far as calling the cops for you. <sighs> That's just stupid. <laughs> they, put, they, they put up a sign in their bathrooms saying, like, if you order this kind of shot, we'll just walk into your car. Call the, if you order this kind of shot... We'll call the cops because you're with, I guess, a rapist. All right. So they're telling you that we're going to give you shots and then take you out to your automobile. <laughs> <laughs> and they, don't see this, they don't see the downside of this. <laughs> I, I think that this was based on, I think some some bars or restaurants were doing this in Europe. And it started there. Mm. But I also think it's a very funny way to prank your friend. <laughs> You're like, I'll have the angel shot. <laughs> this dude's screwed. Please. Cops bust in. We're just friends. Get up. That's him. That's Chris Stanley. No, 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 no. I'll have the he's trying to rape me shot. <laughs> that guy right there is trying to rape me. <laughs> and I'm going to get away. <laughs> no, any new Tinder for you, Chris? I'm going to see uh, the girl I met up with on Saturday night again tonight. This girl, is date three. This is day two. No, this is the girl that has who just got out of a relationship and just wouldn't shut up about her ex-boyfriend. And you banged oh. her? Yes, I slept with All her. All right, let me see her again. Yes, sir. And then I'm talking to another girl as well. Now, here's the beauty of it. That's got to mean a, another qu quick bang. Yeah, that's what I felt. That's what there's, felt good. There's no other reason. <laughs> well, let me grab her. I can't believe this Adam wants to go out with you again after sleeping with you. <laughs> I, don't, I don't get it, man. It's fucking weird. You must have done something right. I think I'm just not. I'm just not her boyfriend. <laughs> You're a good listener. Yeah, she's pretty wild. But I have a feeling she's going to get back with the guy. But, you know, as long as she doesn't find out about me, I'm totally fine with it. Oh, yeah, yeah. I remember her. Where are you taking her tonight? To the stand? 
Uh, I think we're just gonna get um, some drinks afterwards. We're at afterwards what? After, after you work. have sex. <laughs> <laughs> Here, we just had sex, have a pint of vodka. Yeah, she's a Carly Aquilino. Yeah, she does. You're right. Hold on, I don't know who this person is that you guys are bringing up. This is Carly Aquilino. She's on Girl Code. She's a stand up comic. And she's going to be featured on the next episode of Gail Meets Girls. By the way, she's one of our. I don't think she's in Carly's league. No offense to you, Chris. That's always fine. But you're not with an MTV star. (laughs) She's got her style and her hair. Yeah. Yeah. But not that that not gorgeous face. that yeah. gorgeous not the face. Career. I met uh, <laughs> not the career either. I met uh, Carly in the um, lobby when when Emma came in with her. Yes, and I had the strangest deja vu feeling with her. You feel like Carly. you knew her? Have you met her before? Never met her. Never. Obviously, I don't watch Girl Date or anything. <laughs> but I'm like, you seem so familiar to me, and she's like, you seem very familiar to me too. So later I explained that to someone and they said, maybe that's a past life experience. Wow, that would be, what if you were connected? Perhaps you were once great lovers. I, uh, I don't think so. I didn't feel like a great lover. <laughs> Related, maybe? I don't know. I couldn't tell you. As a matter of fact, I, I looked at her and I'm like, does she look like someone I know? Like, you know what I mean? Like, is it th- but it was completely subconscious. And uh, the Gale Meets Girls is uh, is great. I got to hear it last night. Yeah, uh, Carly Aquilino and Emma Willman both, and they're and they're so funny, and there's some really great stories. No, it's really weird. I had a, an immediate bond with Emma Willman too when I met her. Like the first time I met her, I'm like, oh, oh I think I'll always be friends with this kid. I always have a fun time talking yeah, with her. Everybody loves. She's her. so funny, and yeah, she's just like a great person to hang out with. And then her and Carly are like uh, best buds. Yes, and they, they do the road together. They rode together. And uh, there's a very controversial little story that starts that. There is. <laughs> These are the days of rage, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> the days of rage start in one week. <laughs> this will be the defining moment of your young lives. You couldn't be luckier than to have th- this situation. It's the best. Yeah, I mean, if you... Uh, and I think people who voted for Trump will find this very quickly is that uh, there's something kind of boring about having the person you want in the White House. It's the worst. It's kind of boring, you know. You want just the opposite. You want a Nixon. Like, uh, you know, a lot of people who love Obama. It's great. And then what? You know what I mean? I can't what really do you get do? He just lets you down yeah, from time to time. He exactly. He enough. mildly disappoints you, but then he does something cute, and you're like, oh, okay. <laughs> I like him, but... Not the fire that we're going to have. Finally, I'll be... The fire uh, on the mountain. <laughs> finally, I'll be uh, covered under Trump care. That's what I'm after. Get that good insurance. Yeah. Like fucking good shit. <laughs> Kitchen Jack says, honestly, what kind of asshole brings a date to Hooters? <laughs> I guess Look, that's a good point. Hooters <laughs> is a family restaurant. G-Man uh, says, just to remind everyone for Hicks, Opie starts in three hours, so let's wrap this up. They got me, Chris. They got me. You had a little panic moment yesterday. You had a little panic meltdown moment. Gotta keep a cooler head these days. It's 2017. Well, you saw Opie outside, and you thought, why not end my show early? Um, street jokes is Friday. Looking forward to that. Gotta think of a couple street jokes. Uh... Can't think of one right now. Oh, fuck. You better get one for tomorrow. You want to win a prize, don't you? What's the new comedy game show that's going to feature Louis Anderson, Maria Bamford, and Moe's? You don't know about it? I don't know about it. Who put this up? You, Vito? No, no, I didn't put that up. Does anybody know about this? No, but I'm very intrigued. If I don't know how something ends up on the, on this sheet here and none of us know about it. You know what is the biggest thing on the iBank today, though? Uh, that thing that you sent in about the road being surfaced. Yeah, what oh. is it about that? There's something about this video that it went viral, like crazy, like millions of views, and they couldn't really figure it out. But it is just a road being paved in, I believe, Australia, right? So it's right. just like a flat new road, road, flat road, and they're laying down the pavement, and it's just... I think there's something kind of hypnotic about it, yeah. but it's also being done like really efficiently. So you're watching the you truck know, pull I, the pavement 
I don't even know what that's called, like chip seal or something. They're doing like. Here's what it is. Everyone these days is on the spectrum in some way. And there's a soothing aspect to this. Like there's something kind of relaxing. Yeah. Like when I saw that it had so many views, I was like, well, why is this a thing? And then I sat there and I watched the whole video. And it, it's kind of like somebody like perfectly like coloring in something or like. Yeah. I think it's a calming to an OCD. You know what I mean? That people like that calming thing. I'm feeling good. I feel better about myself right now that I'm watching it. Somehow this is bigger than damn Daniel. <laughs> no, I forgot damn Daniel. Damn Daniel. Back at it again with the white fans. <laughs> <laughs> Why? Now, when I was uh, a kid, everybody would want to bite on a piece of hot tar. Really? Yeah. Whether it was roofer's tar. You could tell the roofer throw you down a piece of tar, and kids would chew on it, and they said it was uh, good for your teeth. Really? Yeah, they said it was like a teeth whitener or whatever. I've always really liked the smell of like oh. when it, fresh asphalt is like the best. I'll tell you something that's even better than fresh asphalt. It's a really hot day, and cold rain hits the hot asphalt, and there is a smell that is just, it's not a sweet smell, it's not a... I don't know what that smell is. It's it's like pleasantly stinky in a weird way. Pleasantly stinky. That's the right term. Because there are smells that aren't necessarily good, but they are a comfort. Like, for example, um, when Birdie, my dog, has not been washed, Mm. she kind of smells like popcorn, like the bottoms of her feet. And sometimes I just smell her. I'm like, ooh, you're so stinky. And it's like the best smell. (laughs) I kind of wish you'd never even told that story because it makes you sound nuts. <laughs> it's like the best. It's like, or like she smells like a fresh big cornbread or something. So you're saying uh, a dirty dog and yeah. then uh, cold rain on a hot asphalt. And by the way, that smell doesn't last long. All right. Here's another good stink smell. It's the reclaimed water smell like down in Florida where it's just the water is not good enough to drink, but you can. Have it in your sprinklers. Yeah. <laughs> and it smells like, I'm going to say bum piss, but I don't know if that's. Yeah. Like but the it's ways. that smell to yeah. me, like mixed with like hot humidity kind of yeah. smell. That just smells like summer to me. What well, always smells like at night, too. You know what I mean? Nighttime, those sprinklers at night have that reclaimed water. Almost like a stink. weird well water smell. There's a like sulfur. Much, There's sulfur. a sulfur. I was thinking to iron, but that's yeah. probably what it is. It's no a iron smell. is um, iron. Yeah, I honestly kind of pick up more as a taste. Like if somebody has well, like a well water, and I, it's not a great taste, but I'd just fucking chug it. I could just chug <laughs> cold well water forever. <laughs> All right, some people writing that you your dogs. Paul smell like Fritos. Yeah, Frito feet. Yeah. yeah, I've heard people describe this smell as as Frito feet because it is like a, a kind of a sweet, salty corn smell. My, my, it is, I find it very comforting. And that it's not like wet, du- like it's not like when she's like really gross. This is just like no, the equivalent dog. of like sweatiness, and you being like, "That's a good sweat smell." Wet dog is well, baby sweat is a fantastic smell. Like there's nothing like when baby sweat and then it dries <laughs> during their nap that you could just sit there and huff them like they were an ether rag. But I I remember like, and I'm sure you guys have had this too, that when you're in kindergarten, it's your first chance to get around library paste. Oh, hell and yeah. we would just be pay- passing around library paste. Yeah, me and my friends, and the fucking teacher would come over. What you guys make? And we we're like, nothing yet, man. <laughs> we just but, <laughs> we love this paste. We just fucking sit in here, kind of zoned out a little bit. The jar's still going. <laughs> yeah, there's plenty in this jar. <laughs> I like the smell. There's a lot of garages in Astoria. Yeah. And so like, whenever I walk by, it smells like oil and metal. I love that smell. It's oddly chemical, but I'll just like, that smells good in there. Now, you said there's something added to the oil, and yeah. you claim it's metal. No, there's odd. I, it's, that's what I feel like it is. It's like, it's a smell of oil. It's and, just oil, though. Yeah, it's mostly oil, yeah. But it, it smells, it's just. So it's different it's than a gas station it's smell. It's mostly oil. I'm trying to find out what but else like, is in there but oil. It's like the rusty car smell yeah. mixed with. Yeah, like, like it's in- rusty metal, yeah. And oil. It smells fucking great. <laughs> How could there be rusty metal in the oil? 
<laughs> and why, when's the last time we've had rusty metal at a car place? <laughs> Everything's made out of fucking plastic now. <laughs> the, are you smelling the 1950s? <laughs> um, Joe, best Chester, West Chester. Yes, hey guys, what's up? Yeah. I got a backup gal on this. I mean, I, I, I've i been doing this for years, especially in the morning time. My dogs, I have two dogs, big ones, small ones in the morning. One of them, I, I go downstairs and I lay next to her and I smell, especially in the morning time. My dogs, I have two dogs, big ones, small ones in the morning. One of them, I, I go downstairs and I lay next to her and I smell her feet. <laughs> They're gonna lock you fuckers up. (laughs) They are. I swear, it's so comforting. Uh, It it is. I I, I think it's when a dog sleeps. They put some wall scenes. I don't know what it is, but and I have a little dog too. You guys have to understand this. It's a pole you're smelling. Stop calling it feet. You smell a pole. And the thing is, those like little pads that they have. They're little pad paws. I mean, it almost seems like something that has to be sewn in. Those pads do not seem like they're organic. Yeah, it, it, it's a very weird, t- but it's just callous, right? I mean, I don't know. I'd like to tear it off, though. I feel like I could tear it off. <laughs> I could it. tear it off in one sheet. <laughs> one time, I thought that uh, Birdie had stepped in something, and really, because she started limping, yeah. and I was really freaked out, and I thought she had destroyed like one of her little pads. Because I looked all down, right. and it was all like, oh, why are you telling us? Mangled. So I picked her up, and I'm like really nervous. I like I carry her Smell home, it. and then like I finally get her in the light, and I look, and it was just. A purple Jolly Rancher was just stuck to the bottom what? of her feet. You carry her I'm like home. literally carrying her home and saying to my boyfriend, "Like it's fucked up, dude. I don't know what it is, but her her bat is totally fucked. I don't know what." I have, I have never been so happy to hear the term Jolly Rancher in my life. I feel like great now. Uh, here's uh, Oscar, Texas. Hey guys, uh, one smell that's never bothered me, and I don't really know why. Everybody don't like it, the skunk smell. Well, I, I, I fresh guess. skunk is too much. But if a skunk was there like the day before, yeah, it, there's something haunting. It's terrible still, but you want to be around it. Yeah, when I uh, to me that smell smells like SUNY Purchase. Yeah. yeah, because I think the combination of skunk and skunk weed together right. they kind of blunt blended into one skunky smell. I um, <laughs> we have a guy in our building who smokes skunk. Every fucking night, right? And uh, the super comes and she's like, do you smell that every day? And I go, yeah, I do. She goes, where's it coming from? And I fucking point at the lady who works for Fox News. <laughs> I said, I know. For, I go, she goes, I think he's coming from him. I go, no, 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 no. It's not. It's coming from that door right there. You got to do something about her. <laughs> Um, Larry, FLA. Yes, sir. Yeah. Afternoon. Well, I know uh, one thing I've got is anytime I'm behind a, a like a big truck or that's burning diesel fuel, for whatever reason, that just smells like heaven. Well, what Never else is to- what is in something that makes it diesel? You know, what is the big difference there? I have I have no idea what the difference is. Not one hundred percent sure, but it just. Has that not a great smell? It's not really probably good, but it, it makes you want to just open the windows and let it all in. And it's similar to like an airport with the jet fuel too. Well, you know what I kind of like? I like any kind of fuel runoff that you can smell from the back of a boat. You know what I mean? Like sometimes you look oh, down yeah. and you get that like rainbow <laughs> thing because you're polluting, and there's just something really great about that smell. <laughs> And I love the smell of napalm in the morning. It smells like victory. That's why I say it like I'm gay. It smells like victory. It smells like victory. <laughs> victory for us. Am I right, guys? Um, I can't. Uh, I can't get over the the foot. Uh, dog smell because I'm getting a lot of tweets about people who are saying, "Oh my god, yeah, a Frito feet, Frito chip." Then somebody's saying, "I think it's more specifically tortilla chip." I think that it's got to be something that they're walking around on. You're probably smelling other dogs' piss. Maybe, but it's. I think it's their own. Just because they don't really sweat the same way we do, so I think it's just they whatever. They sweat from their tongue. Yeah. See, here's the other things about dogs that I read before. 
their sense of smell is so good, right? That if, like, when we smell cake baking and it smells good, they're able to smell the wheat, the sugar, any additives. They can cut that down, right? They they can smell things completely differently than we can. And the reason why they like to smell other dogs' piss when they're walking around is because they can tell what they ate and they know what kind of food right. is available. And they're picking up age, male or female. They're getting all the information. They know whether it's boy pee or girl pee. Yeah. Chris, that would be perfect for your tender dates. <laughs> oh, woman. <laughs> perfect. <laughs> I was out with Donald Trump last night. We had three hookers piss on us. Really? Mm hmm. <laughs> to get even with Obama. Were they Why? Russian hookers or American? I couldn't tell by this uh, piss because I've got a cold. <laughs> but I, I'm fairly sure it was an Eastern Bloc nation. Nice. You're just saying nice. You don't mean that. No, it's good to have Eastern European hookers. Oh, uh, wait. Hold on. Nathan is saying something about uh, dog Paul. How's it going, guys? Yeah. Yeah, so uh, I completely agree with Gail. The, the smell is the greatest thing ever. Um, dogs actually sweat through their paws. So, so it is their, a sweat smell. It, yeah, that's where their sweat glands are. They cool off by you're panting. But they, uh, <laughs> you're, you're, that's exactly what you're doing. You're smelling a dog's pit. But well, actually, that makes sense because I, I read when you're trying to, if your dog is overheated and you're trying to get them to cool off, rather than like spray them with the hose on their back, it's better to have them stand in like a stand pool of cool Blood. water. <laughs> yeah. so, because they're going to cool faster by their feet getting cool, as opposed to yeah. you might be like, oh my God, he's so hot. Let me spray him down with cool water. But that's not really going to do I much. feel embarrassed now. <laughs> because I've never known that. And I've squirted dogs down before. <laughs> Help him. <laughs> and I should have just had a nice pan, foot pan for them. <laughs> let them get in, put their pit paws in. <laughs> now, have you ever heard the thing where black people say that white people smell like wet dogs? I did. I did uh, find that out because of just from Google search. Somebody had pointed out if you... Search white people. Smell. Why do white people? Yeah. If you do, go ahead and do it, Chris. Just put, why do white people smell like? And then it'll fill in wet dogs. Wet dogs. Yeah. <laughs> and then, uh, fucking, I, so I brought it up on the air once, and two black buddies of mine were fucking calling me up and laughing, going, that's something we never said around white people. <laughs> But we said around ourselves that white people smell like wet dogs. Is it true though? I mean, I don't. I it's hard to believe, but all you know, if we smell like wet dogs, if your chemistry is different from someone, you know, you could smell someone and be like, that person's sweat smells disgusting, and then you smell another person, you're like, that's not that bad. I always heard that that had to do with like diet or whatever too. Like right. There's certain things that make you. But if if they're let's say they have a diet that's similar to yours, it might be a more familiar smell. It might even smell like something that you smell like, or family members of yours smell like. So it could. You ever been not... around Italians where there's garlic just pouring out of their skin from what they <laughs> ate the day before? Oh, God, yeah. I think you're supposed to take eat garlic with a uh, cold too. Uh. Here is uh, David. David, you're on the Run Fest show. No, you're on Bennington. <laughs> oh, my God. I can't believe I said that. <laughs> David. Uh, yeah, you didn't time yeah. travel. You're here in the present. <laughs> your Max's wife loved the smell of lumber, like at Home Depot or Lowe's. I mean, it, it, it really did something to her. It drove her insane. She loved it so much. Mm, like sexually? Yes. Exactly. When I was a little kid, I went to a lumberyard with my dad, and I loved the smell so much that I said, I want to work in a lumberyard. <laughs> and that was like one of my initial dreams, to work in a lumberyard. And my dad said, I doubt very much that you'll ever end up in a lumberyard. <laughs> That's horrible. <laughs> he was right. He was I, right. I did not have the wood skills that would have been taken. I had a similar uh, experience with nail salons, because I really like, yeah. I know a lot of people hate the smell of no, nail no, no, polish. No, no, I get it. Hate the smell of nail polish remover. It doesn't bother me at all. In fact, mostly men, I have heard, like, do not use nail polish remover in the house. Or, like, oh, can you do that in the other room? That smells disgusting. I love the smell of yeah, it. I like it. 
When I was a little kid, we used to go. I don't think they have this anymore because of the dangers of what happens. But there was this thing at the Franklin Institute where these things that you could go around and smell. And some people, with their heads would kick back. It would hurt them so much, like a chemical smell. And the next person was like, I don't smell anything. And we fucking loved this shit, right? Were you one who could smell or couldn't smell? It depends on what it was. There was like 30, oh, there was a, there was a, a ton bunch. of different smells, right? So you could just go around and people would have all different perceptions of what it smelled like. And then sometimes everybody would hit together. And sometimes you'd be like, I don't smell anything. And then another kid would be like, oh, my God. Like you put a fucking pencil up his nose. But I think they got rid of that because of the way people are so allergenic now. Right. Oh, man, that's crazy. Have you ever been to the would, Franklin Institute in Philly? I haven't. It was like a yearly fucking trip for us. And, oh, we're going to walk through the heart. That's all everyone ever talked about. We're going to walk through a giant heart. <laughs> giant heart, man. Don't forget. Me and you, we're going through the giant heart together. <laughs> I feel like that, that could also be like a romantic thing. Like, who are you going to walk through the heart with? <laughs> yeah, I guess. I mean, it wasn't a kind of Valentine's heart. It was like an actual heart. <laughs> Uh, hey, uh, Ryan, you're on the Run and Run show. <laughs> I'm going way back into that. Hey, hey, what are you talking about? <laughs> hey. So you had mentioned the uh, outboard uh, boat exhaust, and a similar smell up here in Minnesota is snowmobile, but the cold makes it a whole lot different. Mm. And nothing better. Snowmobile. I don't know the the smell of a snowmobile. What about the smell of a fresh murder? No one ever brings that fresh up. Fresh blood? <laughs> yeah. You ever get that irony smell around blood, though? Yeah. yeah. I used to think, and maybe I'm wrong, but I used to believe that when I was a kid, when you know when you hang upside down and the blood rushes to your head? I could smell the blood rushing to my head. Like, I could smell, I would get that scent in my nose. And obviously, I would not know as an adult, because you never do that yeah. on purpose as an adult. That means you've got the shining. I you've shine. actually got the shine right now. <laughs> All right, it's the Bennington Show on a Thursday. It's the 12th of January already. Uh, and Chris, you tell us that the Coen brothers are coming to t TV. Yeah, they're, so they, they're writing and directing a new TV show. It's going to be a Western. It doesn't have a, um, it doesn't have a, a network yet. But they're making, they're going ahead and making it, and they're going to. They're going to make tonight. a network. Yeah, they're going to make a network. <laughs> the Coen Brothers Network, just Coen Brothers movies. Why would you even tell us it doesn't have a network yet? They're putting together their own pilot. Do we have that on mass uh, to announce? Uh, not yet. We've got two to announce. It looks like is that other one confirmed? Uh, not confirmed, but I'm just told looking very good. Just waiting for a final confirmation. The other one, we're just waiting for two pieces of paper to be signed, and we can announce. Both of them are very exciting. Yeah. They're both very cool. Well, we'll see if the Cohen brothers will announce their network. I hope so. <laughs> Let's try uh, to get that to happen the same day. This video is kind of, uh, well, it's alarming. It's uh, a monkey having sex with a deer. <laughs> and uh, this is a sign of the end times. Oh. There's a monkey... I guess I'm going to call it a lonely monkey. You know how fast you got to be to have sex with a deer? I mean, those yeah, things they are ass. really fast. Yeah. Tears is pretty calm. Well, the tears not going to suspect this. Yeah, there's no, no deer I, thinking I'm going to get raped. <laughs> and almost. Oh. Like, oh, no. look at him get the idea for it. <laughs> oh, God. <laughs> He's going. Yeah, he had to get down into the, uh, yeah. into the holster there. The deer is like, why would you do this? No. Oh, the deer's like rubbing the monkey jism. You're like a baby, but uh -huh. you just yelled that out. <laughs> <laughs> well, I didn't expect the, the deer to like it so much. How he I says he think, likes it, he's cleaned himself off. I, don't I think say, hey, but I don't think, I don't think I'm right. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think she knows really, like, I don't think she was into it. I think that this is just something they have to deal with. I mean, it's something you wouldn't even expect. I mean, this is no weirder than if a monkey jumped on you and started having sex on your back. <laughs> oh, look at now. See, that monkey just chased the other ones yeah. away. Like, no, this is my deer. Right. This my is deer, my, deer. Sex, my sex deer. This is their idea of having a sex robot. <laughs> <laughs> he 
loves this. No, table. yeah, he actually. Yeah, she's had enough of his shenanigans. <laughs> like she's just like, all right, this is like once rodeo, or twice though. was fine. It's like a fud rape rodeo. <laughs> <laughs> Now, if they were actually able to make a hybrid species, do you monkey think it would, deer? a monkey deer, do you think that would be gross or adorable? I always wanted to see a deer eat a banana, so <laughs> this could be perfect. It'd be freakish if you see a monkey deer run across, run across like the road and has hands. It'd be fucking frightening as hell. It's frightening enough just to see a monkey somewhere, <laughs> like if you weren't expecting it. I didn't know there was any place in the world where monkeys and deers coexist. Yeah, it's called the zoo. <laughs> <laughs> I once saw a fucking leopard right next to a polar bear. So it happens at the zoo. How? <laughs> they just had separate cages. Now that would be a good hybrid. Leopard polar bear? Leopard bear? Uh, there was the these kids when I was little, they said there was a bear wolf. In the fucking woods. And they called this dirt road that didn't have a name Bear Wolf Lane. They go, You go down Bear Wolf Lane at nighttime. And I'd be like, This, but I'm not going to. I was always That's... ready. I was always ready to believe any fucking urban myth when I was little. And I'd say to my dad, I go, You ever been down Bear Wolf Lane? And he'd be like, What the f? What do you fucking buy into everything everybody says? <laughs> Bear Wolf Lane. You must be like an idiot at that school. <laughs> I guess someone saw it before, Dad. They saw the Bear Wolf. No, seriously, that's like a why thing. Why would that road be called that? It is because we're always like this. So why is it called that then, Dad? And they were like, Explain this. to me. The kids would be like this. A bear Wolf will fuck you up. You know what I mean? Like they were, And I'd be like, oh, shit. I don't want to be anywhere near that thing. I don't know. Something with a fish would be great, like a lionfish. Yeah, like with a good, like a solid mane, like a mane that like kind yeah. of is fin like. Yeah, and covers the gills. Vita, what about for you, big Italian kid like you? What are you thinking about? I thought a turtle dog would be really cool. <laughs> what? <laughs> is it a really slow dog? Does it still have Frito meat? Does it have a shell? <laughs> it's just a. It's just like a big bit pull with a shell on it. I'm gonna say this, Chris. If it doesn't have a shell, it's not a turtle. Okay. <laughs> like what? Like. Because if you went the opposite, where it was just like a dog with a turtle's face, that would be disgusting. <laughs> or, or it's a dog that can put its head inside of its own body, but there's no shell. Uh, yeah, it would make a turtle. <laughs> that would just be a necklace dog. <laughs> <laughs> now, if you were to take like a horseshoe crab and a turtle, oh, you can make something out of that. That, that could work. Because then that would be like turtle with the stinger. Yeah. So that could be kind of neat. I remember when I would be down at the beach with friends of mine, we out in the ocean, and this fucking kid I know, he was always fighting horseshoe crabs. He would dive under the water and come up with a like, great big one, and then throw it at you. Oh, those things are pretty, they're pretty scary. It's just scary. fucking scary to see a horseshoe crab coming your way. <laughs> well, I think you have like a giraffe shark, where it's like a shark with a ridiculously long neck, so it could pop his head out of the water like a submarine, like a giraffe shark. You just said like a giraffe shark at the end of it. <laughs> you created it and then used it as its own example. This is a cool in the gang scenario that I'm very confused by. <laughs> you know, like a gra giraffe shark. You might be onto something. You could probably fucking sell that. To, you know, I mean, it makes a lot more sense than a fucking shark NATO. I was at the idea to make a, a movie about a giant fucking lobster, right? To sell the shark NATO people. And at the end of the movie, they just nuke the fucking ocean it's in, hence boiling it to death. Hence. <laughs> That'd be my, my pitch. Hence boiling the giant. Now, who are you Lock. pitching this to? The Shakespeare Network? <laughs> <laughs> Whoever makes shark. Uh, sci fi. There you go. Sci fi network. Uh, look, there are already, like, fucking monsters out there. You know what I mean? Like, there are things that could legitimately be considered monsters. Except for we know what they are. Anything in the deep, any creature of the deep, that shit, it, it's insane that that's on the same planet. It was like clear skinned, glowing fish. It's fucking Yeah, bioluminescent and like. How about one of those big ass baboons, too? They scare the shit out of me. 
<laughs> like that fucking big. Uh, that's monstrous. The butt has always made me uncomfortable. Um, Too bulbous. <laughs> Abraham. Red. Yeah. Yeah, I just. I just wanted to let y'all know that there is such thing as a lionfish. What? There is such a thing as a lionfish. All right, don't get oh, mad. Okay. Yes. What is it? Let's Good. see it. Let's take a look. It's not my fault. <laughs> and, uh, and I just had a question. I wanted to hear uh, who's your favorite comedian all time. I'll take your uh, answer off the air. Thank <laughs> okay, you. Okay, th- thanks for taking it off the air. <laughs> I mean, this, <laughs> you know, this comes up from time to time, and it normally has to do <laughs> with whatever age you became aware of. But just like there's certain things, and and let's say rock and roll. Can you ever say anyone could replace the early rock and roll stars? It's hard. And I feel like our society will always be caught in a Richard Pryor, George Carlin thing. Yeah, the, the always when you ask people, it's usually one of the two. Yes. And no matter what the age and it's, it's because like young they, people. Yeah. Because of what everyone's doing now, whether it's, uh, you know, Dave Chappelle or Louis C.K., whatever, you can measure them back to those same two people. And you would agree? Like, do you feel. It's hard to get around that. It's hard not to say. You know what I mean? In terms of stand up comedy, that's not it. Uh,. I mean, if I was going to throw anybody else's name in there, it would probably be Bobby Kelly. So it would be Richard (laughs) Pryor, George Carlin, and Bobby Kelly. John, in Tampa. Hey, speaking of Bobby, we got a, don't get a whole lot of comedy down here, but uh, going to see Joe Coy and Bobby Kelly. It's a great Uh, fucking show. Oh, unbelievable. And so it's uh, a little bit bigger venue. Where are you going? I'm really excited. Where's the venue? Happy Theater. My happy theater. Oh, I love that. I love that place still. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Should be really good. So, dying to know any. Can you tell us what the story was you told last night? Was it the catfishing one or? Yeah, it was yeah. the fast daddy. Uh, Twenty five years before catfish, catfish. <laughs> and I heard you do that one live. That was an unbelievable story. This, this <laughs> thing uh, the other night, uh, I was pleasantly surprised. By how much the audience uh, enjoyed it, it. It absolutely killed. Like, we we were dying. We were absolutely dying. It was such a fun night. But that story, it, it destroyed. I was thinking about telling that story tonight at the stand. But then I thought, I don't know, maybe the story works better in a bigger room. You know what I mean? Yeah, it felt great in that room. Like, yeah. it it did feel really good because it is a it's a big story. But I think uh, I don't know. I think you should do it. I uh, got to a certain point where I just saw people's faces alarmed <laughs> and horrified. <laughs> it was a mixture of both. Um. <laughs> so yeah, that was a lot of fun. By the way, that show the other night. Dan and, and Billy do a, a great show. Yeah, they do it once a month. Uh, it's called Hindsight. Uh, Dan Perlman and Billy Princell host it, and uh, there's always a great lineup. It's a lot of fun. Are you... Um, by the way, Vito, did you send in the Praying Mantis video? No. Was it you, Chris? I, it was me. Somebody did. Maybe you haven't seen it yet. Uh, or maybe it was sent by TR, but I haven't forwarded it yet. Uh, we'll talk about that tomorrow. Remember I told you when I was a kid, I yeah, saw yeah. Praying Mantis. This is the best video I've ever seen of a praying mantis. Was, That's a weird animal. Like, that doesn't even look like it's from this planet. It's literally an alien. A fucking alien from another place. And I, it took me years before I even told another person I saw it. Because I was a little kid, and I'm in the front yard and we're all like running around and we had bushes there so I'm crawling under the bushes going away with my friend and I'm like three or four and I was face to face with a praying mantis and I saw the expression on its face and I saw the intelligence in its eyes <laughs> and I just started crawling backwards <laughs> oh, like poor. one thing I do like about myself I will back down from all kinds of situations <laughs> Street smart. <laughs> street, is- street smart is not being in every fight. You're not going to fight a fucking praying mantis. 
<laughs> you're going to fight someone you can obviously beat up. <laughs> or if you don't have a choice, fight. Sometimes jump a fucking fence if you have to. <laughs> Climb up a fucking tree. Run into a cop's arm. Doesn't matter. Whatever you have to do. <laughs> I was walking past the uh, <laughs> Trump Tower on my way in today, and th they have like uh, like a little chain to keep everybody from crossing the road. And the guy was on the other side of the chain, and he was trying to you know dodge traffic. And the cop goes like, "Hey, what the fuck are you doing?" <laughs> and I was laughing my ass off. <laughs> and then the guy turns around, "Oh yeah." Because of this asshole. He starts pointing at Trump Tower. <laughs> this is the fucking reason we just can't walk through, jaywalk through traffic anymore. Uh, Hard Rock Johnny wants to talk. Yeah, I don't know if anybody, you know, I don't know whether you guys are in the mood for it. Let's leave it up to the team to decide. I vote yes to Johnny. Chris? I'll vote yes. All right, never mind now. We don't move on. There's no excitement about this. Vote. <laughs> that was just the fuck. I'll vote yes. Yeah. It suck my dick, it's, Pepper. Um, there's no sense in having a, you know, a third vote on this, a rubber <laughs> vote. Uh, Thank Johnny, you. how are you? I'm good. I And I have a perfect room available if one Mr. Ron Bennington would love to do some sort of, like, you know, storytelling full show. Just let me know. That's an interesting, oh. uh, that's an interesting proposition. If I could put is, all the stories together in the one night and call it is, mostly stories. <laughs> oh, that's a good that title. Is, that is, that's a that perfect title. That has been my title. dream yeah. to have you here do this. For how long have I talked about that? Six weeks. <laughs> I, I want to say it was it was early December. I started, so it might be just about six weeks. You're right. Long December, and there's reason to believe. And would a shark horse be really scary? By the way, first of all, a shark with a saddle on it to me would be a shark horse <laughs> or fun. Yeah, big legs. It's a different a kind of rodeo. Them. <laughs> I'm trying to put it together a new show called Shark Spank, and I just have girls on and I spank them with a, a sand shark. Hot. Oh. He thinks I'm hot. <laughs> I vote yes. Opie's here! And the show Opie's here! I like to say you'll run the fucking Cossacks. You would have been like the worst Jewish girl ever. <laughs> Jewish girl ever. How are you ever going to do well on J-Swipe? <laughs> Any luck there? I've made some matches, but I'm not, not the no one I want Who's the new to. girl that you're talking with? I'll show you the new girl. Why don't you take one of these girls to the Hard Rock? That's not a bad <laughs> idea. Johnny, can you hook me up? Yeah, sure. Sure, Girl. I'll make you pay nothing. You look like a big baller. <laughs> just You can go there and just say my usual table. <laughs> I'll even set it up. You know what we could set it up so you could walk in through the back, like through the kitchen, kind of like oh, Goodfellas good style? Johnny. Oh, that is a classy, point, classy thing. Uh, uh, you just pointed Earl and some other guy. You two. There's <laughs> always something going on with you two. <laughs> uh, she's a singer, a teacher, a lover of cats like yourself, mm. and a food enthusiast. You like food, oh, Chris. No, can't get enough of it. <laughs> wow. <laughs> And uh, she works at a very famous school. Aria, who I've been uh, talking about I a know. lot lately. She's been on my mind. She also tends some bar. Nice. I like her. She looks a little straight for you, Chris. Yeah, she seems straight-laced, but, you know, give her a try. Maybe she Can likes the bad the, boy. Let me see the face. By the way, she's got a cool style. I like her glasses. Yeah, but you know what's always weird? Like if you meet someone with glasses and they like, seem sexy, and then they take their glasses off, <laughs> you know, during the lovemaking, <laughs> it's just weird. What's that? Who are you? Who am I they get all like squinty. They get squinty, and then you see that little indentation in their nose from wearing glasses too long. So where are you taking her? Hard rock. Yeah, I think you should really do that. 
And then when you try to pay, like Johnny will come over and be like, please. Hey, not for be- you. Hey, <laughs> not for you, can- Mr. S. I would put maybe we put like on the big marquee out front. Hard Rock welcomes Chris and whatever the girl's name is. Oh like, my shit. God, Chris! Johnny, I, we gotta talk. I got I gotta secure a date with this girl yeah. first. And then Johnny, you don't even say you come out with a mirror with two big fat lines cut on it, <laughs> and you're like your usual, Mister S. I'm not gonna lie, I would be so impressed with this date. You like those lines, do you? <laughs> Oh, Maybe you could, we could have you have dinner up uh, upstairs on the marquee, like if it's oh inside. Oh my God, Chris! Chris, that we would like be set fun. up the table for you. Bring out the lamp amazing. all plugged in. You know what? Don't even waste it on this bitch. <laughs> yeah, pick a different yeah, one. Or yeah, you find he just keeps doing that. that once a week. Like he just keeps recreating this date every time he takes someone out. It's a cheeseburger every single time. <laughs> <laughs> God, that sounds amazing. And at the end of the night, you're you just like, uh, you get a phone call, and you're like, oh, I gotta go, and you just dive off the marquee. <laughs> <kid. laughs> this is incredible, Chris. This is gonna lock it up for me. <laughs> I got a bunch of uh, matches on J Day because I started lying and saying I'm just Jewish. <laughs> Wait, what? Cute, though. Let me say. Wait, so you're you you are saying that you're Jewish? Yeah, I'm just saying I'm just Jewish. All right. I don't think that that's okay. That's like one of the options. I don't think now look at this cute girl. Look at this cute Jewish girl, right? Uh huh. And then for her movies, League of Their Own, You've Got Mail, Love. Great Wedding Singer, so good. And um, she's just too nice for Chris. This <laughs> is a disaster waiting to happen. That's why I really want to fucking. Oh want my to god! Her. Look at her with her Jewish friends. Like the fucking Jewish Supremes. <laughs> <laughs> no, this girl is too too sweet for you. She is too sweet for rock and roll, Chris. I'm going to give it a shot regardless. I don't think you should. I want this He's girl become, to have a nice life. <laughs> even if it's a disaster, it'll still be fun. He's become obsessed with dating, though. Yeah. It's my obsessive compulsive personality. I have feels playing a, a, a part in Yeah, this. this is the new addiction. How about when we saw the 18-year-old girls on his fucking thing? I, that made me so uncomfortable, and I just don't think it's okay. <laughs> Why is it okay? They're of legal age. You know, they're they're legal not swinging age, back sure. at They're barely can. legal. I mean, they are barely legal teens. Yeah, I can swipe on them. They're just not swiping back at me. Let's call it. <laughs> let's start a dating site called Barely Legal. Oh, that's good. <laughs> and we'll just put up fake pictures <laughs> and lead to traps. <laughs> <laughs> what was that fucking pet catcher on 2020? Uh, Chris Hansen? That's yeah. him. He was one of the Hansen seat. brothers. <laughs> you can use Lauren from down the hall as your model. Oh, Johnny, I remember you took her out to lunch in a very uncomfortable I, thing. I never did. <laughs> I don't know where you get these things from. <laughs> she told me. Um, <laughs> and then we did the bathing suit test. <laughs> where I had to say to her, I put on a bathing <laughs> suit, and then I said, touch me all the places that Johnny touched you. <laughs> <laughs> Johnny, uh, is this your favorite weekend of the year or next one in terms of best games? These are always, you get four, you should get four really, really good games, you know, as opposed to last week where you got four really shitty games. This, you know, the, the, these, are, these are always the good games. All right, let's, let's all pick them right now. <clears throat> all right, uh, Saturday, 4 o'clock, Seattle at Atlanta. I'm going to pick Atlanta to win that one. I really do. Seattle can't do it on the road. Atlanta's going to take it. Johnny? Atlanta all the way. Wow. I'll that's... go Seattle. All right. Gail is Seattle on that. <laughs> and I bet it all. <laughs> Wait. Oh, yeah, all in. Oh, okay. You have three more bets. <laughs> all right. back. Uh, Houston at New England, the 8 o'clock game. Not even close. Oh, New England. It's going to be a beat down. Yeah, New England's going to just romp them. I'll go here. They may even cover. Oh, my God. Well, and I'll saying? bet it all. <laughs> they, Am say, I doing this right? Houston yeah. in the points. <laughs> 17 points. You can never, not, you'll never see that spread again. It's 17 points is the spread. That's crazy. Oh, yeah. That's be. crazy. I feel like i got to take that bet. <laughs> I feel like I need the 17. <laughs> but what, if, what if Belichick wants to make a statement? What if he's like, fuck this, I want to just run over these but, You make a statement in the Super Bowl. There's... No reason to make a statement now. You can't. You can't predict Belichick. He he always goes a hundred percent. It's a fucking great defense, and you're saying is they're going to lose by seventeen? 
It's crazy. All right, go ahead. Sunday's games, one o'clock game, Pittsburgh at Kansas City. I'm going to take Kansas City. Really? Mm -hmm. I'm taking Pittsburgh. I'm going Kansas City as well. I think they can do it. I'll tell you, though, the uh, Kansas City running back right now is my favorite player to watch. Spencer Ware? The, uh, is he the starter, Johnny? No, you mean the, the kid who's running back the kickoffs. Tyreek Hill? Yeah, Tyreek Hill. He's insane to watch. Yeah, and the the whole thing is just a blast. Uh, he's crazy. But I'm still taking Kansas City. I'm going Andy Reid all the way. I went <laughs> got, to fat. Got, yeah, he got to love a fat coach. <laughs> yeah. Fat, fat, and never care. Yeah. Ne <laughs> never, ever. Not Not even. care in the world about his fatness. <laughs> <laughs> Megan uh, McCain back every day. I get to oh, see her. Yeah. She's back again in the white fat. <laughs> <laughs> the Sunday 4 o'clock game. Green Bay at Dallas. Uh, Green Bay is all beat up. Uh, they're not going to have their star uh, receiver. Jordy ain't playing. And I'm taking Green Bay. <laughs> Cowboys are going to take this thing, and I'm depressed about saying that. Packers all the way. Go, pack, go. <laughs> Gail, I'm sorry. You do have to pick the Packers. All right. We don't allow anyone on our team <laughs> to pick Dallas for any circumstances. I wouldn't. I wouldn't. Chris just did. Kick him off the team. Chris, I have zero faith or connection to. <laughs> I have okay. jigs, so it's probably it. good for me to take the Cowboys. I can't wait till he gets arrested in a Tinder rape. <laughs> <laughs> Look, oh if God. I do get arrested, take my side, because that woman's going to be lying. Look, if you get arrested, I will go and talk against you. Oh, don't, please don't do that. <laughs> Your Honor, not only am I here to... Say that his character is bad, but I brought in 700 different audio <laughs> to show. Oh my god! That he's disgusting. Oh. All right, Johnny. Talk to you soon, my friend. <laughs> Later, Bennington. So we should get four good games, hopefully this weekend. At least, let's say this three. I'd be happy if we got two good games after last weekend, or if there's even one. Uh, oh, and then it's the championship games. Yeah. Then we take a week off, and it's the bowl of super. The most, 51st time. The most super of all bowls. Oh, yeah. It's a, just the super of a bowl. <laughs> and uh, Spy Report. Spy Report. Spy Report. San Diego has, Chargers have announced they're moving to Los Angeles, California, and changing their names to the Doors. <laughs> they're going to be the L.A. Doors. <laughs> <laughs> pretty cool. <laughs> See him running through the tunnel. <laughs> do, 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 do. Well, the day becomes the day. That becomes the day. Try to run, yeah, try to hide. Ring on through to the other side. And they just broke on through to the 20 yard line. <laughs> Every fucking two minute warning, this is the end. <laughs> My only friend, the end. Uh, but where are they playing, Vito? Are they playing in the same place that the new Rams are going to be playing? No, so they're apparently going to move to the StubHub Center, which is an MLS soccer stadium that only seats 30,000 people. Well, that's just into the new stadiums built, yeah, right? Yeah, that's going to be for the next two years. But 30,000 is crazy in the NFL. That's. That's smaller than most baseball stadiums. But I love it. For, first of all, uh, at least you'll see a full stadium there. Although I'm not 100% sure of that since it's the San Diego Chargers <laughs> yeah. in Los Angeles. And the Rams moved there, and the TV ratings went down. Pe more people enjoyed not watching the Rams than not watching any team the year before. <laughs> <laughs> We'd rather well, watch nothing. Los Angeles hasn't had a team in 20 years. So they just enjoy watching the NFL. Like, I mean, I mean I'm not like, going to games. You know what I mean? If someone said you're a fan of the NFL, yeah. But I'm not going to go out and sit in the fucking cold like a moron. Like, let's beat the Redskins. I mean, what am I, a fucking child? <laughs> oh, get those dolphins. Stop it. That's fucking dumb. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Sitting around cheering for someone. It is really cold. Too. Even when it's hot, Johnny's constantly at the Giants games texting. This blows. <laughs> yeah. He's never happy. All right, Flathead said, 
I will open for you at the storytelling with Hard Rock Johnny. Flathead, <coughs> you're all my fucking stories. So you can have your own stories. <laughs> uh, Joey, New Rochelle. What's up, boys and girls? Hey, what's up? Did you see the hideous new Chargers logo yet? What a joke. What is the NFL doing? LA Chargers logo. Five to one, baby. One and five. Uh, that's pretty ridiculous. It looks like a fake Oliver Stone team. <laughs> <laughs> Who's that? I don't she know. She looks like a real star. She does. She looks like a real star. <sighs> I'm going to find out who that was. Oh, Chris, what's the difference? Don't <laughs> text and bother people. He, he, I was, you know? was going to test Spencer. Why won't you let Spencer do his work? You never book anybody on our show, but you're always saying, who'd you get for the other shows? Maybe I should have Jen move over to booking because Chris lets me say no to everybody. Yeah, she could maybe be like, no, I, I here's why. <laughs> this is a good idea. That's what she did for your show, right? Yes, she's, she did. She absolutely did. When's Gail Meek's Girls go up? Uh, I believe it will be out tomorrow, Friday. Wow. Yeah. That quickly. Yeah. All right. Exciting. That's will very else. exciting. Yeah. Uh, Emma Woman. Yes. And Carly Aquilino. Uh, both very funny. And it's From really Girl great. Code. From Girl Code. Chris, you ever live by a guy code? Uh, no. Me neither. Vito, you live by a guy code? Sometimes. Well, that's not sometimes if you live by a code. Well, like, there's some that I think you need to follow. So that and that, but then you do. Okay. You just don't live by every code. Yeah, it's like... It's uh, like what are your guy code. codes? Like, I, I, I don't... I would never uh, date somebody after a friend did. False. I would. And have. Who cares? <laughs> what else? <laughs> Then sometimes fifteen minutes after they did. I, I would also I would never tell like uh, somebody's girlfriend like stuff they were doing. And that means that you're not friends with her. Yeah, like my loyalty. If it depends on who I'm more. If I'm loyal to him, if he's my friend, it's not like I met. If so I then, met if, him, if you met a girl before the guy, right? Yeah. Then you would be part of a girl code. Yeah. Why isn't it just a friend code? I think I think I would be going more towards a friend code thing. It's not just strictly guys. It's just I'm going to, I live by. That's a, not a code then. That's not a code that just like, I pick who's ever here first. All right, give me another one of your guy codes. It's going to be straight guy code. I, uh, I don't know. I think, I don't think I do follow a guy code now that I think about it. There's only two things I what can think What about the, like, is there like a cock block one? Oh well, like if a, dude I was, team. if a dude I was like hanging out with was like talking to a girl like that night and like trying to like have relations with her, <laughs> I wouldn't try to like move in on that woman. What's he saying? What is he saying? He wouldn't. He would not uh, go for a girl that he knew his friend was going for. And, oh, I don't think that's even cock blocking. I think cock blocking is when you're like, you're gonna drop me off. You know right. what I mean? Like the guy code thing is, look, if your friend that you came there in the car with has met someone, then you got to find another way home. <laughs> or the guy code would be, you never do that to a friend over right. a, a POA. <laughs> <laughs> now, Jen, you watch girl code. What is yeah. like a common girl code? Like what's one that they bring up? Um, it's like kind of similar to guy code. Or like they talk a lot about relationships. It's so like, um, I, Here's one for you. Because guys will always do this. You and your buddy are out, right? He hooks up with the pretty girl. You take one for the team, go with his less pretty friend, right? Now, would you do that on a girl code thing? If your oh. girl hooked up with a sweet gentleman, would you yeah. take the Chris Stanley? The wing woman. Yeah, be the yeah. wing woman. Me. And you're, and you're going to spend the night with Chris. Yeah, hey. I going? would, I would, I would entertain him. I'd like hang out with him, right. like you know, to distract him from hanging right. out with the other friend. But I would never. Leave I would right. and have. I wouldn't <laughs> have ha been with a girlfriend who's like got her sights on a dude, and I'm like, well, it's me and you, kid. 
<laughs> That's what we got to do. <laughs> like, let's make the best out of this. Let's, let's make this happen for them. I'm not going to screw her over right now. Okay, it's very nice. Yeah, I've been there till 4 a.m. Like, yeah, I'm just having fun watching this TV show with you while they do other things. <laughs> They're doing real fun stuff, but let's just watch this, te- this television. Sometimes that can be a nice night. Yeah, no, I mean, you meet a nice friend. and like, I've actually I've become friends with sometimes people that's happened with. Yeah, you become friends with everyone you meet. It's important to mm-hmm. you. I like having a good social game. Oh, you he's know why? very friendly. Because you have no brothers and sisters. So you're forced to find family wherever you go. <laughs> oh, yeah. I get and attached real quick. Yeah, that's sad. Um, all right, what's another girl code one? Um, uh, Would you date uh, a friend's ex? Uh, no, I wouldn't do it. I've never... Like, they've become not attractive to me after they date because i see him i get really especially if it's my close friend he's like my brother now you know like me and him are best friends and i never cross that line. see that's the thing (laughs) about girls they can take sex out of it very much easier than i think guys can but i've heard this from girls before that if they think a guy is attractive and that that guy doesn't find them attractive they find him less attractive immediately right they're like i thought i was into him but i'm not he's kind of ugly (laughs) <laughs> Where a girl, I don't think a guy ever changes that thing. Mm-hmm. Like the girl that hates me is still attractive. Right. We can be honest about that. Like if you, if a girl puts the feelers out and she's not getting anything back, she's like, yeah, I'm not into this anymore. And then you don't see him the same way again. You don't go, you don't have that fantasy in your mind where you're like, oh my God, he's so great. I really, you're like, yeah, didn't, didn't work out. All right. What about this one? You're, you see a guy and you're attracted, right? Mm hmm. And then you found out that he was with a girl that you don't necessarily like or find attractive. Like a skeezer. Oh. Uh, <laughs> like a skeezer. A skeezer. Does that ruin him? For you? Yeah. No. I would probably want to date him. You would like that, that even more. <laughs> just to like, yeah, just to get back at her if I don't like her. Yeah, definitely. That is mature. <laughs> That's a very mature thing you just said. <laughs> Vito, do you know what I'm talking about? Does it change it for you? No, I just look at everything the same way. <laughs> Chris? I probably, yeah. Um, it kind of weirds me out. but I probably Like if you find out that she was dating Sam before you. I'm like, I can't date you, lady. Lady, lady again. He <laughs> so says <stupid>. lady a lot. <laughs> His dates are always lady. <laughs> like I found out that Sam's wife was with him before me. And it really weirded me out. <laughs> It really weird me out. <laughs> and I'm like, no more dates between 7 uh, a.m. and 11 a.m. for me. Uh, uh. <laughs> Not and uh. Because I was like really into my George Bush Senior. George Bush Senior then. How far along is his wife now? I'm not sure. I'm going to say seven months. Wow. We got to think of a present. Yeah. <laughs> what should we get him? A puppy, maybe? No, what? A puppy would be nice with little <laughs> smelly pad balls. Yeah, yeah, yeah. See, I'm good at presents. You are good at presents. You came up with that puppy thing. They're going to love that. Oh, yeah. Maybe a couple puppies. Who knows? What, what, should, what, should, we, what should we get, Vito? Maybe like a little Sam likes wrestling, and I feel like his kid, he's going to want to like wrestling. Have a little wrestling belt for the baby. But don't you think all everyone's going to do something that obvious? Yeah. I think it's better to go with something functional. Like a breast pump. That would be nice for Sam. Mm. <laughs> that way, while he's at work, he can breast pump. <laughs> Maybe a future gift, like something for the kid when he turns like 13. Isn't there a thing called Baby's First Razor? Where you just get a little <laughs> razor for him? Because a lot of babies are born with that fuzz. Yeah, the little peach fuzz. And mine is a little fontanelle, too. Oh, bu- 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 All right, a woman wrote this. I don't even consider a guy as potential mate until he sends out an interest vibe. So guys can't live that way. No, it's too confusing. But then the ball is in your court. Then who's Isn't court? in the guy's in the court. court? Yeah, because then if you i mean i'm sure you've had this experience where you found out later in life someone liked you or had a crush on you and then she never said anything because you weren't acting on that thing 
But also, I'm very fucking dumb, so that's, that also hurts me. So they should just be, uh, you know, open about it. That's why it's great about these apps. It's like, yeah, the interest vibe is already out there. It's You match, so there, there's the interest. Everyone knows what's going on here. Here's our buddy Chuck. Hey, Chuck, what's up? Hey, Ronnie, have a good holiday. Hey, yeah, it was very happy. Well, good. I wanted to know if that girl that Chris is going out with, no, he hasn't been vaccinated for uh, small cocks. <laughs> God, you didn't get it. your small cocks vaccination. <laughs> <laughs> Haven't got my small cocks yet, Ron. He's got and an outbreak sure, right now. I'm sure that I'm sure that that girl will feel like that deer with that damn gorilla fucking. <laughs> Chuck, it sounds so, like you got a cold toe. I went down the damn uh, watch the national championship game down in Florida, and it turned cold down there. Oh yeah, I know. I heard and, that. Yeah. Uh, yeah, and then I got got the sign of shit, and I came up to Charleston and had dinner a couple of nights at those restaurants, and it warmed up a little bit, and I'm just, my sinuses are fucked. Yeah. <laughs> hey, uh, South Carolina must have went crazy over that game, huh? Six seconds left? They say, they say Saturday, you know, shut Clemson, South Carolina down for the parade and shit they're going to have. That'll be a massive party. That's where Chris ought to go if he wants to get a piece of ass. You ought to, Chris. You ought to go down there and get a piece of ass from the clubs of girls. I like some, I like pieces of ass. <laughs> yeah. There's a there's a lot of good looking women in Clemson and and you bring a bottle of liquor and some skunk weed, you're hooked. Did you start smoking pot again? Uh no, I haven't smoked weed yet. Would you if the young lady wanted to? Yeah, I, that's let's, <laughs> let's vape up, lady. What do you got? Edibles, what do you got? Let's roll something up. So you're gonna get it from I, I don't <laughs> I don't I don't do no edibles. That shit'll fuck you up too bad. I I either do a vaporizer or I just smoke the weed. I was uh, talking to a guy the other night. He said to me, I don't smoke shit. He goes, I'm a 100% edibles. 100%. I, I couldn't do that. I know I know a guy that ate too much of that shit. I thought the fucker was going to die, man. He yeah. was fucking You can get weird. You can get weird on yeah, the edibles. Sounds bad. It'll feel like a trip if, yeah. at, at the fucking strongest sense. Like, what? Am I fucking? What's happening right now, dude? Sounds I remember terrible. it's bad. It's it could be bad. We used to when I was in, in high school. We used to, we had all this fucking hash, and the thing was always to eat a piece of hash and then smoke hash. Eat a piece of, and you got fucking whacked on this, right? Yeah. Uh, it's because we had so all of our older brothers were dealing hash at the time, so we had nothing but everyone had pockets full of hash. And then, so I'm in the fucking high school auditorium, and I'm fucking whacked out on this, right? And I'm sitting there, and I can't even pay attention. And it's like, and then everyone, I thought I heard my name, and everyone turned around and looked at me, and they're going, go, go. And I'm like, what? <laughs> what is everyone saying? And I had to walk down. Because it was the senior superlatives, <laughs> which I wouldn't have ever expected, but I got class clown, and I had, and and it just seemed like a crazy dream. Like everyone was looking at me at the same time, <laughs> and I am like, what? And they're saying, go, go! Oh Holy shit! <laughs> hey, Ronnie, yeah. did and you then when I walked down there, by the way, nothing happened. Like the people just stood there. <laughs> Like, you didn't get an award or something. You just had to stand Dude, the- uh, Yeah, and I was like, this can't be something <laughs> that's happening. <laughs> this is great for my storytelling show. Did, did you ever smoke any hash oil? You put it yeah, on yeah. the joint. Yeah. That shit will tear your ass up, too, if it's good. Well, you used to, we used to put it on joints, and then we'd also smoke it out of these glass pipes. Like it was fucking yeah. crack. And just that's fucking why I that ain't got up. no brain cells. Well, you know what? You don't need too many, dude. You went down. You saw your team win with six seconds left. You're you're enjoying life. You have a good time. Yeah, that's what it's about, Ronnie. You can't take it with you, and I ain't leaving my money to all my fucking kids. Yeah, that's smart. I'll, I'll leave them some, but God damn me. I ain't never seen no trailer behind a hearse. That is true. Too bad. Uh, is too hey, bad. Chris. Yeah. Treat her, treat her like you want it again. Not just them knock her hips out of joint and go home. All right. That's true. Yeah, All right. That they, is good advice. Be a gentleman. I I, I want to be a gentleman. You know? All right. Uh, For Chuck. I, I'll see you, man. Thanks, Chuck. All anyone smokes now is hash and cannabis oil. That's I it, never huh? see anyone with fucking bud. It's weird. Everyone just has the fucking vaporizers and it's fucking oil. I don't like the vaporizers. They seem stupid. 
I had a vaporizer, but you put <laughs> bud in it. Like, you didn't, wasn't oil. Right. That I really liked before, but that's the last time I really smoked weed on a Remember when that basis. guy used to send you pounds of pot here? That was fucking nuts. Pounds. Oh my God. Yeah. He would get like three, four. Were you five. paranoid about it? Yes. <laughs> and I had to tell him, he's like, I was going home on the fucking train with three pounds of pot. And I'm like, you moron. Take a car. Yeah, you and have he to. goes like this. I didn't even think of that. Oh my god, are you kidding me? The, the, the amount of times, times. they like post up with yes, the drug dogs and the and little they're, they're fold little, out tables. Yes. Random, random search. Yes, I know random searches. And you definitely would have been fucking seen as a dealer. Oh, oh yeah. Are that, you kidding? That way? Yeah. I but, have a friend who was arrested. He he just I mean, I can't remember the exact quantity, but they had decided he was a dealer, and he just, like, had some weed on him. And they're like, oh, nobody would terrible. have this amount. And he's like, no, I, I, I do. Like, this is I just mine. This is just my weed. Yeah, yeah you'd have been deep shit. Yeah, I would. that's felony weight, having a fucking couple pounds of weed on you. That's a felony. stupid. Right? right? It's retarded. It's now you can have, they go up to a, uh, an ounce on you, and they'll give you a ticket. Yeah, but what if you have yeah, a but this pounds? was like that you're going fucking it, it, yeah. Up. Where do they think the ounces come from? <laughs> <laughs> Everyone, break this up quickly. <laughs> All right, here's the thing: when you're buying weed, the guy that you buy weed from, right, buys weed from a guy who buys weed from a guy who has a machine gun. So you're like three, you know, yeah, you're like three levels away from someone going, "This is worth killing and dying for." This amount of shit that we're dealing with right now. Yeah. And that's the way it goes. Now, the weird thing is, you never run into people, like a guy with a beer distributor doesn't need a machine gun. You know what I mean? <laughs> like Tito's not down there fucking hand club. <laughs> so that goes to show you, when you make something legal, you take the violence out of it. Yeah. You know what I mean? Exactly. And that is also true of the prostitution business. You know, well, I had to explain this to uh, this was years ago um, and it was a conversation about why, you know, legalizing weed would be a good thing or at least decriminalizing it. And they're like, oh, you know, a lot of kids make their money, a lot of kids. And now you're taking that away. And I'm like, but that is not worth the violence on the other end. Like you are like that specifically is people should not die over weed. Yeah, the same thing could be said. Those kids, if they really want to make money illegally, they'll go find a new thing to absolutely to illegal. So uh, to keep that an illegal proposition, it makes people feel okay about breaking the law. Yeah, and and prostitution is ridiculous as well. It's just like it it keeps it uh, a violent and and dangerous, unsafe, business. certainly yeah. unsafe. Although it's nothing you would ever recommend to anyone, you know what I mean. It would never be like I hope right. my, my niece gets into the the prostitution business. She's so adorable. I'm sure she could make six figures for herself. <laughs> <laughs> and now that it's legitimate, she gets health care. She gets all the benefits. And so you would never want that. Yet at the same time, you don't like the idea of there being these violent yeah, fucking games that get played. Um, and right now. We we will have a president who ran a gambling house. You know what I mean? We have a president who has had the conversation before. Look, I know you're upset. We're going to give you free breakfast and a beautiful uh, gym bag. Oh. It's a Trump Resorts gym bag. I guess I us. like the gym bag. <laughs> It's you know what I mean? Like I he's guess. had to chill people who are like, I don't know what my wife did. I don't know how this happened. I understand. <laughs> Look, here you go. There's a buffet. I'm going to give you these two tickets. <laughs> There's a buffet downstairs. It's got everything. Like sausage, bacon, you know. All you can eat. You like flapjacks, right? Yeah. Go down, eat a little bit, have some coffee, think it over. And you're going to see some ways out of this piece. But what about this? The Desert Inn has heart. That's what we're fucking dealing with right now. That's what we have. We basically have a, a, a coupier is our fucking new president. All right. Uh, Friday, we're giving out a bunch of cool stuff because it's Street Jokes Day. Why don't we take a break here, Chris? Who do we got coming up later on the show? Alan Zweibel stopping by. One of the original guys. One of the original writers for SNL. Also did the Gary Shandling show, which is a breakthrough show. 
a great writer of books. Matter of fact, uh, Alan told me this before when he started comedy. He and a kid from uh, Long Island used to run in together and do sets. And that kid's name was Billy Crystal. Isn't that funny? Wow. That's the guy that he started with. That's incredible. Where they're like, what do you think about tonight's show? I just didn't think <laughs> you were good, Billy, but I don't know whether I had to. <laughs> uh, right back, Bennington. Bennington Show. Bop, bop, bop. It's Thursday, January uh, 12th. Up on the iBank today, uh, Aziz, Attell, Seinfeld, Chris Rock, Amy Schumer, and Dave Chappelle. All part of the Woodstock of Comedy lineup that showed up last night at the Comedy Cellar. Very, very cool. Very, very cool. That is a fantastic show. It's re- Well, it's beyond fan. Any one of those people would be an exciting night at the Cellar. But all together, and that's just uh, kind of mind-blowing. Um, Bruce Springsteen has just uh, given over his archives. And archives are normally anything that you have lying around to Monmouth University. It now becomes something that educators, historians can sit around and go through like, oh, look, it is high school poetry. There's a line here that showed up later on Greetings from Ashbury Park. That's the way this stuff gets looked at. And also like old photographs, like old magazines and articles. It's everything. It's everything. A- about the artist, of course, this started as something that they did with writers years ago, and uh, now Dylan just did it with a I forget what school, and and Springsteen has turned his archives over. How long till Vito and Leslie make the trip, little day trip together? Well, does that mean like I can just go and look through stuff, like I don't have to be enrolled in the college or anything? I can't tell you that. It's up to Monmouth University. Aren't you the dean, though? Yeah, I was <laughs> for two years, and then I was released during a scandal. Um, they allowed me to quit rather than be fired. Oh, well, uh, that was nice of them. I left during the night. <laughs> I'm sure anyone can go see it. Now, you don't need a Monmouth at University ID. Go seeing it is one thing, but... Being able to go, you know, physically pick up the papers, I don't think they'll ever let him. God, looking no. at the fucking lyrics of growing up in his own greasy fucking hands while he's eating some kind of a... The chicken parm, let's be honest. <laughs> chicken parm is just one of the many things he... Can... He never stops in. No. Mm-hmm. Eddie care. Trunk never stops in. Doesn't care. Disrespects us. <laughs> never invites me over to a show. He goes, oh, you can do it any day. Yeah. What day? What day can I do it? You gotta come at me with specifics. I know what it is. I'm getting a little bit too much love from Hard Rock Johnny for his fucking comfort. I'm a little bit buddied up with Jim Florentine, and he doesn't like that. <laughs> he wants to keep those worlds separate. Really? Because mm-hmm. maybe I'd like to bring back my own metal show, that <laughs> other metal show. <laughs> uh, but that would be fun if the, you know... To go all through that, I was never the biggest Bruce Springsteen fan. I didn't even realize people loved Bruce as much as they did until I started working here, specifically in this building. And people talked about going to see 200 Bruce shows or whatever. Well, you and I were in a debate uh, with somebody from the music department about U2, and he's saying, "I don't think U2. I'm not going. I'm not going to give away who. It's Liam." I'm not gonna. Okay, okay. I'm gonna just say it's Liam. Yeah, go ahead. And he goes, "You two will never have that Springsteen vibe where people." Uh, and I go, well, "You're thinking that because you're right here in Springsteen country, but I'm sure there's people in Dublin oh, yeah, that yeah. feel exactly the same way about you two. And you two will be one of those. But he's saying that you two has fallen off because they still try to have hits. And I go, "Okay, when's the last great Stones?" fucking album 1980 you know what i mean (laughs) and yet stones fans are there forever same thing as with springsteen same thing with mr william joel who comes in and does a show once a month i mean you can youtube a u2 concert and see the just insane numbers that they get like insane and that's everywhere in the world 
everywhere in the world. <laughs> yes! Well, they're back to do the Joshua Tree, 30 years. This would be amazing. Why? You're going to be there? It's the same fucking tour. I literally saw the tour with um, Gail's mom, Gail's aunt, and Lou Angel Wolf. I remember we were all <laughs> together. She was dating Mr. Lou Angel Wolf. Really? I don't know. Maybe we all just want his friends. <laughs> but I thought there was a little ass grabbing going on. Happens. Um, so I remember that tour. And then everyone uh, just went out singing 40. And I'm like, this band is going to be incredibly big. And then I think they did their live album. And then the next one was that disco shit. And I'm like, what, why are you afraid of who you are? You know what I mean? <laughs> right. That's when they reject it. They were not going to be the big Jesus band that people have a religious feeling. You know, there won't be any more spiritual breakthroughs at these shows. But at it's the disco, time. baby. Yeah, they were doing that. They, that was the whole Pop Mart thing and all that kind of shit. Mysterious ways. Those are good songs, but they did not want the big anthem, the change the world anthems anymore. They, 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 I guess it got scary. Yeah, you know. But then they go back to it. Then they yeah, got back to being anthem. But it's not the same thing if you're if it's not real. You know what I mean? Like if you're not living it, you just can't pull it out every once in a while. I'm telling you, they were fucking living it at the time. You know what I mean? They were, it was like seeing the 60s. Right. You know what I mean? Like It was as serious as the 1960s, like where love can change everything. People were believing it. And they, they backed away. They go, this got, this got scary. You know, I don't want to be John Lennon. John <laughs> Lennon didn't want to be John Lennon. He, it scared him. You know? Um, but other than Coldplay, does any other big bands... Is, do we, like have the, that level of like the numbers and everyone yeah. showing up and i don't know i mean i know that coldplay does and probably more so uh in europe even than in the in the u.s but they're massive in the u.s so they play stadiums here we're not chili peppers i don't think it's the same level i saw iggy pop say the other day he goes you know for years people um you know, didn't pay attention to him, and he was always a cult act. And then he said he went to see the Red Hot Chili Peppers, and he goes, "Oh, there's five of me on stage." <laughs> and I thought that was really, I thought that was really funny. You know, um, I don't think the Red Hot. First of all, the Red Hot Chili Peppers, they've never kind of went away, even for a second. But I don't know if some of their stuff sounds somewhat dated. I think they're a, a certain band time where and place. I think they're huge. But have you ever met somebody who they said like Red Hot Chili Peppers number one no, favorite I band? No, I haven't. But it seems like they do have a following of people like that. But I don't know anyone who says I know people who like them for <laughs> sure. <laughs> I know people who have gone to their concerts, but I don't know anyone who's like best band of all time. Red Hot Chili Peppers. They're only chili heads. I think that's what they call themselves <laughs> if they exist. <laughs> I feel like you could just be a chili pepper. Food just fighters not. do really well. Did you see Chris Christie is inviting the B Street Band to his party at the inauguration? <laughs> it's what they say, the first Bruce Springsteen band. And that's the thing. This is what I hate about tribute bands is Christie gets to have the Bruce Springsteen that he wants, not the real one. Yeah. <laughs> You know what I mean? <laughs> One that agrees with the things he yes. says. Jesus Christ. He's getting all the benefits. Hey, there's a thing up on the iBang today. Songs that you don't want to hear while um, you're having sex. It's five songs you don't want to come on. Oh. <laughs> uh, an iPad shuffle while having sex. They went really far with this title. But who did it, Chris? Lisa Best. All right, she's got a new special coming out. She just released her new our debut album, Brain Bank. Nice. Congratulations. All right, so let's just play that even before we go through hers. What's a song that you don't want to hear during a lovemaking 
sesh. Okay, I would say the first one that popped into my mind that would be very uncomfortable is that like you and me, baby, ain't nothing but mammals. I don't know this song. Oh, is that um? What was the name of them? Like they all dress like like monkeys in the video. But it's a, a song about sex and about like humping. It's like a very childish. D- Discovery Channel. Is that the name like, of the do song? It like they do it on yeah. the Discovery Channel. I don't know the song. You know it. It was Bloodhound on, Gang. Yeah, the Bloodhound oh, Gang. Oh fuck! I remember Bloodhound <laughs> Gang. I put it up. I feel like this would be too just much? like yeah, it would just two be on like nose? Si- two on the nose and really silly. That immediately it would be uncomfortable. No. Yeah. You know, you're going to have to... I may be wrong when I say this, but I think Iraq was a big bloodhound <laughs> gang. Well, see, gang. now that makes me feel bad because it's, it's a two-parter because if this were to come on, it's like on the nose, it's uncomfortable, it's silly, so it, like the mood is ruined. And then on top of that, it means that person has this on their iPod shuffle. Yes. So it's a two-parter. What did she use uh, first, Chris? First, she had plug it away first. Chris. This is uh, this is the five five songs you don't want to come on iPod Shuffle when having sex by Lisa Best, Aaron's Party, Come Get It by Aaron Carter. Oh, okay. I remember the young uh, Aaron Carter. Yeah, this would be uncomfortable because I think a child's voice might okay, be a young boy's voice might be uncomfortable. <laughs> what for you? What wouldn't you want to hear? I think similar to Gail's idea, it's two on the nose. I'll make love to you by boys to men, but specifically because he starts talking really softly during the song, <laughs> and I don't want to hear another dude like whispering like sweet nothings to me. <laughs> yeah, I think people probably would have thought this would have been a good song. I, yeah, I would but say maybe that most people much, have used this. It could be too much pressure. Yeah, you know what I mean. You're like, I've got to live up to. It's, it's not this part, though. It's when he starts just talking to you. I don't want to be spoken to. <laughs> Why wouldn't you just say those uh, same lines to your lady, to your lady friend? I don't know. One, I think I don't think I'm like, I don't think I have enough soul for it. <laughs> don't He's also that. like, it's such a powerful song. I might want to stop and just take it in for a little. <laughs> I think that you now, should just Is that on your along? iPad? Oh, yeah. This is on mine. <laughs> so I would say this. I think it's dangerous to have songs there that you don't want to pop up when you're in different company. You're going to need to make a bone mix, I think. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Now, you know Vito is friends with Coach, right? Yeah. What if those two hooked up together, and then he was listening to Center Field, and it said, put me in Coach? <laughs> How would you feel would that about that? Too two much on the nose? On the nose? <laughs> no, I know. I think that would be Put me in, Coach. <laughs> <laughs> and then whisper it along as you're... <laughs> I'm ready to play. Today. <laughs> you got to be careful when you hang out with someone named Coach. <laughs> you really do. And hey, what's the story with her coming back for a b- goodbye show? I actually saw her over the break. She said, let her know. So I'm going to talk to her. Why are we waiting? we we'll let her know. Wouldn't that have been the time to talk to her? <laughs> book her, bruh. What can make it fucking go slower with you, Vito? That's what I'm saying. Should I book Coach? Sorry, Chris we were- Stanley. Okay. <laughs> uh, Lisa's least, least next song on under five is the full house theme song that's stupid what about for you though for me if Gangnam Style came on I'd be fucking freaked out now you wouldn't have that though I've been listening to it lately you really would keep that on your fucking oh, like, eye on a main part. like mix yeah sure yeah of just a big I would never have that there All right. I'm gonna YouTube or nothing <laughs> <laughs> if we're going specifically my own, because this already is something that I've thought about before. Like, it's weird enough that I have this on my phone to listen to at any time. So if this would just came on at random, I would be embarrassed. But it would be really silly if it was during a lovemaking sesh. And that's Genuine Pony. Like, that's two on the nose. And then they would be going, why Why do you have this? Is this what you're into? You really like Genuine. I really like this song. It's a really good song during the commute. Magic Mike had a really exciting dance sequence to it in the sequel. Why or are maybe you watching Magic Mike? <laughs> <laughs> Why do you have this old genuine song? Then you'd be trying to go to the rhythm too much. <laughs> there would be no way not to. I'm doing it right now. That's pretty terrible. <laughs> 
All right, Rob wrote this into us. Um, lightning crashes would be a tough one <laughs> to pop up. Tears in heaven. <laughs> I just kind of. <laughs> Diane B says butterfly kisses. Oh my god, that would be just the worst for any scenario. <clears throat> that song, I didn't even know it existed. I was once having a <clears throat> conversation about just terrible songs. I didn't even know it existed, and I was like, "This is maybe one of the worst things I've ever heard." But yeah, nobody wants like a daddy daughter song to pop on. Yeah, that's true. Dance with my father. <laughs> hey, it's our buddy Ezra. What do you got, pal? Hey, what's up, there, everybody? Love you all to death. Of course, love you to life too. Thanks. All Good right, Ezra. So, this young lady and I, we're, we're getting it on, mm -hmm. and the TV's on. We are making it happen. And Amazing Grace comes on TV, and we're like, uh, not only was it Amazing Grace, it was the Elvis version of Amazing Grace. Yeah. So, we just looked at each other and we were like. This is not going to happen. And you I was literally it. stopped it there. We were hot and heavy and do <laughs> amazing. That was it. That I, was it. It was over. Thanks. I'm looking at some of mine. Uh, and I'm embarrassed to even say that I have meatloaf on here. <laughs> <laughs> Bat out of hell, maybe it would be an uncomfortable one. Yeah, <laughs> any of the stuff from there. The hell, what's it gonna be, boy? <laughs> <laughs> Do you think Inside Out by Eve Six is embarrassing? Um, I think I'd be okay with it. Really? I think I'd be able to to carry on. <laughs> I'm not gonna lie. Can it can it be a song just so catchy that you would you would get distracted like Bohemian Rhapsody? Like, would you would you need to stop? <laughs> the only way I would be uh, distracted at any time with. Bohemian Rhapsody is as I was on my way to turn it off. <laughs> <laughs> All right, I found one that would, I would fucking have to stop making love. I'm going to be 500 miles. That's I'm fucking sorry, blast. Do you have that? I had that, yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that would be great. <laughs> no, it wouldn't. I think it's romantic. <laughs> um, here's uh, Steve. Steve, what's up? Hey, as far as um, like on my phone, what I what I had that could pop up, I think I think uh, Ben Folds Five Brick would would not be. That's a good another one. Uh, rough one. Yeah, that's uncomfortable. And then you're like, is this where this is going? Yeah, Are we on our way to a brick situation. Yes, you don't want a sad abortion song unless you're coming back from an abortion clinic. Yeah, then you want to play it and go. Listen, listen to this. <laughs> I have a uh, great song for this situation. Zach in Montreal. Hey, how's it going? I got two for you. It's Boom Bop by the Hanson Brothers and Come and Eileen, Dexter's Midnight Runner. Well, you can only pick one. Well, I guess it's Boom Bop because that's just too catchy. Um, <laughs> Boom Bop makes Lisa's list. The problem with Boom Bop, it goes back to the other song she had, is children singing. <laughs> Here's some of the people sent to us. Um... Bad company feels like making love would be pretty know. difficult. <laughs> Two on the known. <laughs> Feel like making dinner, 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 dinner. Feel like making love to you. And <laughs> Jazz put in the wreck of the Edmund Fitzgerald. Yeah, I think there's something about a, a, a ship crashing and drowning people <laughs> that could probably turn everybody off. <laughs> Um, Cats in the Cradle. Uh, LB says Nine Inch Nails, Animal. Going to disagree there. <laughs> no. Going to That's disagree. Good. Um, Sean. Sean, what's up? Ronnie B, I'd say one of your favorites would have to be an awful one. Cree, arms wide open. With arms wide <laughs> open. <laughs> Again, that's just more embarrassing that you have it on that, your fucking right. iPod. Um, Hey, uh, our buddy Cigars and Scotch. And if we're going into uh, personal collections and guilty pleasures that are on there that could pop up, Tony Basil's Mickey would definitely be a boner killer. If you own that, that's enough said. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, I don't care if you're you're hearing it on the radio. You know what I mean? Like, and you're singing along. You can't help that. Yeah. But to me, the fact that you have this, 
I think it tells uh, everything we need to know. <laughs> <laughs> Good to talk to you, buddy. Same here. I love that guy. Um, here's uh, Ron, Missouri. Yeah, back in the early 70s, I was making out with a nice lady in the front seat of a car. And on the radio came on, She's Having My Baby by Paul Anka. She's having my baby. What a lovely way to tell you how much she loves me. <laughs> Fucking weird song, right? It's like, it's like the opposite of Brick. Yeah, it's the, it's, uh, the counterpoint to Brick. And yet, probably stops more people from having sex than Brick ever could. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Rich in Tennessee. Hey, Ronnie B. I think anything from Craze would, would definitely knock it down, but you could also go over and listen to Sleeves, do some Mighty Horse. All right, uh, thanks. Um, who else is on her uh, list, Chris? Time of My Life by Bill Medley and Jennifer Warnes from Dirty Dancing. I had the time of my life. That one might be distracting only because you'd want to just start reenacting the dances. <laughs> Can you do the lift? <laughs> All right, here's some. Smack My Bitch Up by Prodigy. <laughs> I don't know. Oh Daddy's Home. Yeah, not good. Uh, Pop the Coochie. Pop. <laughs> The Gucci, pop, pop, the Gucci. Uh, Enigma, sadness, crazy bitch by Buck Cherry. No. <laughs> Ouch. I'm, I'm a crazy bitch, bitch and fuck so hard on the top of it. <laughs> uh, Daddy Donut said the John Cena theme song, <laughs> which would be weird. Here's our buddy John. John, what do you got? Hey, guys. Remember this one? Hot child in the city. That would be odd that you would even own that. That's the. That's the weirdness of that. <laughs> Craig, what do you got, buddy? Rape me. <laughs> Rape me. The old Nirvana? Yeah, the old Nirvana. <laughs> the old too. Nirvana. You actually had to say the old Nirvana. <laughs> <laughs> um, he <should> Eric. <laughs> Eric, you're a... What's up? Uh, actually, I had this on my honeymoon back in the dark ages when you had to burn CDs, and I had room left over at the end of the CD. So I just threw on some whatever I had on. Uh, and it happened to be the theme song from the TV show Sanford and Son. <laughs> East End Rob, what do you got, buddy? Ronnie, Gail, what about any song from the group Fun? Fun. Fun. With that annoying sharp voice. Fun was uh, big for a couple minutes, right? Yeah, they got a... We are young. Yeah. People got really into that song. Yeah, they loved it. And you couldn't go anywhere without hearing it. Wasn't he dating the girl from Girls? The Girls Girls? Leah Dunham, yeah. Oh, yeah. really? I did not know that. Yeah, because I, I saw him at like the Grammys or something. And like he had won the Grammy. She was like, yeah, Hercules, Hercules. <laughs> <laughs> Um, Sean, what's up? Lost you, buddy. Uh, here's Brandon, Arizona. Hey, I love you guys. I just got to say, what about Chumba Wumba, Tub Something? That would be, uh, that would be weird. Uh, <laughs> Tim in Louisiana. How about a little, uh, Danger Zone by Kenny Loggins? The fact that you would own Danger Zone would, A, be weird... But B, if you just started thinking we're flying into the danger zone <laughs> like Tom Cruise. <laughs> yeah, I would agree. <laughs> I would kill myself. <laughs> I remember hearing this song in real time going, man, the 80s are weird. Like, I like was right looking, now, this time is weird. <laughs> I know. I was looking back on it like we were weird in the 80s. Um, here's one that I uh, uh, get a... I kick out of uh, Nazareth's hair of the dog. Um, Dave sent that, called it a boner killer. <laughs> um, Hart said magic man, which who wants to live up to that? You know what I mean? That's, <laughs> right. a, that's a really good point. Which one are you hitting, Chris? Nazareth. Oh, Ben, I love it. 
How long does it take you to get to it? Forever? I can get to it. It just has to sh- buffer. That's the problem here. And it's all because of why? They switch servers here. For, so the, all the internet at Sirius XM is garbage. I think this would actually work for you. Oh, you dropped down out of it instead of segueing through. Hey, uh, Andy, Illinois. Hey, uh, one time my wife and I were day we were having sex, and man in the box came on, and we both just started busting up laughing. Yeah, that's a weird totally one to moment. suddenly your man in the box <laughs> while you're doing it. Not exactly comfortable. Um, this reminds me, we're going to do the Seattle GPS? Yes, it's on deck. Oh, it is. It's the next one. Oh, it's not, uh, not, uh, I misused on deck, but yes, it's in the running. Okay, so you don't know what on deck is. <laughs> I, mis- I misused on deck. <laughs> All right, you've seen a baseball game, right? Yes, I have. Who's on deck? Uh, the next batter up. Yes. <laughs> That's like you saying it is next. <laughs> and we got Flip being part of that, right? Yes. He has a lot of opinions on Seattle grunge. He's the historian. And there's plenty he doesn't like, right? Yeah. Let me guess. Pearl Jam, Nirvana, Correct. anyone who's ever made any money. <laughs> <laughs> Bunch of sell- sellouts. <laughs> All right, we got Alan's White Bell stopping in next. Uh, I didn't know this. He's got a new book. For this, we left Egypt, co-authored with Dave Barry and Adam Mansbach. Uh, it's going to be available March 7th online. And in stores. Did we get all of his other stuff done? Yes. There we go. And it's like a whole thing, right? Yes. So, uh, as I said, this is... uh, uh, This is one of the guys who's been around comedy for 40 years. Uh, Co-created the Gary Shandling Show with Gary Shandling. Uh, We'll be right back. Bennington. Welcome back to Bennington. In studio is Alan Zweibel, Alan's new book. For this, we left Egypt, co-authored with Dave Barry and Adam Mansbach, will be available on March 7th online and in storage and on Twitter. It's <laughs> at Alan Zweibel. I love the way he, he hit the... He, I know. Mark. He wanted he to nailed get a little the question joy. Mark. You For this, saw we left the- Egypt? <laughs> yeah, he did good. Thank you. Is, yeah. like, I'm thrilled. <laughs> that well, was like a is, big acting role for you. <laughs> you. You know, he's goy, but he is from Queens, so... <laughs> no, no, so then you're honorary, too. Then, I mean, <laughs> you know... <laughs> <laughs> How did this idea for a book come up? Alan? You know, I, I co-wrote a novel a few years ago with Dave Barry called Lunatics, and we we got we got along very very nicely. Yeah. And um, and then I co-wrote a book, a middle grade book, last year with Adam Mansback. Um, if you don't know his name, he wrote a children's book uh, a couple of years ago that sold like a gazillion copies. Am I allowed to say? Yeah. And he, it's called Go to Fuck to Sleep. <laughs> yeah, right. Yeah. Okay. And this is a book that parents of young kids give each other. And if you want to really laugh your ass off, Google it and uh, for the audio version. Yeah. It's Samuel L. Jackson reading this book to a kid. <laughs> what a fuck to sleep. You know, he's really tired and everything. So he and I wrote a middle grades book um, called uh, Benjamin Franklin, Huge Pain in My mm-hmm. Ass. But they, they didn't let us use the word ass. I mean, I... So it's blank, yeah. okay? Yeah, which is sort of ironic that a guy that wrote "Go to fuck to sleep" <laughs> wasn't allowed to say "ass" in the thing. <laughs> so the three of us were down at the um, Miami Book Fair about two years ago, and um, uh, we were hanging out together. And I think it was Adam who said, "Why don't we, the three of us, do something together?" And we said, "Sure, what?" And I think it was he, I think it was his idea, let's do a, a parody of the uh, the Passover Haggadah. <laughs> now, for you people out there who might be strangers to the uh, to the religion, that's the book that you read from when you conduct a Seder. So we got a, a couple of Haggadahs, and we we uh, retold the story. And this is a lot more interesting and a lot more. <laughs> you, you Jews out there will have a choice to make in a couple of months when, uh, when, when Seder time comes. <laughs> Uh, but Dave Barry is—he's not Jewish, right? He's married to a Jew. Oh. Okay? and his daughter was bat mitzvahed, yeah. and uh, his daughter Sophie. We went there, and it was one of the funniest bat mitzvahs I've ever been to because you know at that stage of uh, 
at that point in a bar or bat mitzvah, the parent gets up and extols the virtue of their, their right. kid. This is the greatest kid who ever lived. <laughs> Dave said everybody does that. Uh, he said to his daughter, he says, I'm going to go the other way and tell everybody what's wrong with you. <laughs> <laughs> and it was hilarious. You know? yeah. so, um, so we had a lot of fun doing it. And yeah. um, th- that comes out in March. You know, I just uh, rewatched a serious man, the Coen Brothers movie yesterday. And a right. big part of it, the, the ending part is all about the bar mitzvah. And I'm like, people, you got to be in touch with the thing of how terrifying things are to you when you're younger, that when you look back on it, you know? Oh, it's it's horrifying. I mean, you you get a kid who's 12, he's just turning 13, yeah, and you're teaching him this foreign language, right. okay? And he's got to get up in front of everyone, his parents, his sisters, <laughs> brothers, relatives, grandparents, you know, friends of the family, and sing in this foreign language. And um, at the worst age to sing, yeah. right? Just you know, his voice is there's changing. an actually a pretty funny story. Um, the temple that I was bar mitzvah at is on Long Island. It's uh, Temple Bethel. Mm-hmm. And a couple of years ago, they wanted me to come and speak uh, at some fundraiser for them, and because they were hurting. Uh, financially, which was really a moral dilemma to me because, like, how much do you charge to speak at a fundraiser <laughs> for a temple that's in trouble? And they, they took me out and to talk about the evening. And they said that the cantor who taught us bar mitzvah lessons when we were 12, right, what he did for some reason and still has them are index cards of, he's now in his 80s, of every kid he ever gave bar mitzvah lessons to and wrote notes about them. They got my card. This was, and I was bar mitzvah June 1st, 1963. This guy's had this card in his garage <laughs> since then. And if you look at this index card, it says, he's never going to do it. <laughs> he's going to embarrass his whole family. And that's the kind of pressure. You're absolutely right. This is horrifying. When yeah. I uh, moved to New York, I was uh, about 14. So a lot, most of my friends were Jewish, but I had like missed all the bat mitzvahs and bar mitzvahs because it had already happened. <laughs> right. So I was like, now I have all these Jewish friends. I was like, they're all talking about these great parties they all went to. I was like, hey, yeah. Is anyone left? No, right. it's, it's already done. Left. It's all done. <laughs> it's all done. Well, you know, uh, Alan Zweibel is sitting with us. Uh, his uh, book uh, for this, we left Egypt is March 7th. But I always explain your career is almost the Forrest Gump of comedy. I mean, you've been everywhere with the biggest of bigs and all the right such. It's amazing to me. I've been very, very lucky. You know, um, when I started, you know, I was writing for those comics up in the Catskill Mountains, right. selling them jokes for $7 a joke. And um, I wrote for every... Every comedian you've never heard of, <laughs> okay, mm-hmm. I wrote for them. <laughs> and then when I got the job as one of the original writers on SNL, it opened up so many doors. It really did. But when I was starting, I became friends with these guys who were just starting themselves named Billy Crystal and Larry David and Richard Lewis. So as everybody started to blossom, if you will, or start mm-hmm. to reach their stride, we've all leaned on each other because you you like to play with your friends so um but yeah but i've been pretty fortunate yeah who were the who were some of the mountain comics that you were a guy named morty gunty (laughs) a guy named corbett monica (laughs) freddie roman oh yeah dick capri yeah lord vic arnell uh mal z lawrence um Oh, more? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, here's the thing. Uh, all those people, you know, those, it's almost like when that was happening, we couldn't wait for that style of comedy to end. And now it's almost the only stories that interest me. You know, they're just fascinating. Well, you want to know something? Yeah. When we were growing up, these were the guys who were on the Ed Sullivan show right. a lot. And um, they were show business. And I remember as a kid growing up on Long Island, if it was like a Memorial Day weekend or Fourth of July weekend, my parents would take us up to the Catskills and we'd go to Grossinger's or the Neville or the Concord and uh-huh. see these guys. And they were really pretty funny. And then, you're right, when we got to a certain age, that was the kind of comedy we rebelled against. Right. I mean, Alan King was like the epitome. He really made it. Yeah. He was a huge name, but he epitomized 
the he was the fat cat with the cigar right he was the establishment you know and that was the guy that when we started snl in 75 the logo was saturday night live uh written in spray paint on the outside wall of what was then called the RCA building, which yeah. I guess is what the Comcast building now. Yeah. <laughs> and um, so it, 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 it basically was symbolic of this. We were going to make fun of, or we were going to besmirch that. Yeah. You know what I mean? So you're absolutely right. And now I, you know, I don't know if it's come full circle, but I think that there is an appreciation. Those guys are dinosaurs, you yeah, know? Yeah, and they're very, I mean, they did not work the easiest rooms in the world. You know what I mean? Those were tough audiences to win over. And I think everyone has a lot more respect for that now. And, and you want to know something? You got a guy like Freddie Roman, and you get some of these guys. They What they did were able to do is they were great equalizers. They can go into any room right. in America. It, it, it could be a corporation event in, in, in Las Vegas. It could be a nightclub here in the city because there were nightclubs back yeah. then. Or uh, as an opening act in any of the theaters in the round, these guys, when I was writing for them, they would open for Steve Lawrence and Edie Gourmet at the Westbury Music Fair on Long yeah. Island. Or, you know, uh, there was a, a, there were a lot of these theaters in the round. And I'd see these guys get up and they'd kill. They somehow were able to work a room. And once again, they, they epitomized everything. They go, oh, God. They talked about, you know, their wives not, not sleeping with them because they just got their hair done that afternoon. You know, yeah. who the fuck wants that? And now I'm 66 yeah. and I've been married for 37 years and I get it. <laughs> so, so those guys were geniuses, yeah, you know? They were brilliant. <laughs> uh, but when you guys started uh, SNL, yeah. that was, I mean, I don't think the established guys liked what Lauren was doing or. Any of that type of thing, right? Like, even Carson didn't look over and go, oh, I'm glad this is, is happening. I, I, You know, something, I don't know what their opinion was. I think they were dubious. Because mm -hmm. we came along, you know, look, if you look at variety shows prior to SNL, and trust me, I have uh, a manila envelope this thick for you at home. It's about an inch <laughs> thick of all the rejection slips that I had gotten. Everybody had a variety show back in the early 70s, yeah. whether it was Cosby or Flip Wilson, uh, Rich Little, the Jackson Five. Everyone had uh, eventually had their own. Sonny and Shea had a mm -hmm. big show. And they all came out in tuxedos, the men did, and the women came out in like these Bob Mackie gowns. And then here we come along. And Belushi, <laughs> you yeah, know right. what I mean, which was a little bit antithetical to it, the whole thing was, yeah. I think that Lawrence, uh, I remember him early on referring to the show, even with its look of like the off Broadway version right. of, of what was, you know, the Broadway version of comedy, television comedy. So I think that there was a little bit of head scratching, but I think that there was a hell of a lot of envy because the show uh, was able to, even very, very early on, say, to say the things that these other people wanted to be able to say either on television or... It was stuff that they did in the car, or they, they said to the band mm -hmm. to make them laugh, and we were just doing it on television for millions of people to see, you know? Yeah, and it was incredibly... You know, it was, like it's hard to think now that that was shocking, but it was incredibly shocking if you're watching at home... When that show came on TV, it you was, couldn't wrap your head around that. Well, you couldn't wrap your head because you have to understand there was no cable. Mm -hmm. There wasn't even Fox, ABC, NBC, CBS. That was television. So it was very, very strict. So whatever uh, our expanding of the boundaries, if you will, they, they were done in small increments. You're able to do more the 10th show than you could the first, right. or the 100th than you could the 10th. And I think that there, there was a degree of um, cunning mm -hmm. that we had in terms of dealing with the censors, you know what I mean, to try to get something past them. And um, it was frustrating but fun trying to tell them. Um, I remember um, Gilda had this character called Emily Latella, and she was a little old lady who uh, was uh, hard of hearing. So she used to come on Weekend Update and give editorial replies to editorials that she misheard. 
Okay, so she'd come on and rant on mm-hmm. and on and on about saving Soviet jewelry. Okay, <laughs> you know, and, 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 and you know, violins on television, and and then she would be corrected to go, no, no, that's violence on television, not violins. And she goes, oh, that's quite different. <laughs> Never mind. And then after a while, it ran its it, it ran its course. You know, people would be writing in, and they were given their suggestions, which would not a hell of a lot worse than ours. You know, <laughs> and I, um, there was one. Um, what was it? Oh, presidential erections. Okay. Right. And you go, okay, fine. I, th- I think we've had it. And, but I thought that maybe there was, um, a little bit more life that we can give the character. And so Jane Curtin was now the weekend update the anchor person and Gilda in front of the uh, studio uh, audience, the, the dress rehearsal. There was, you know, live show you do in front of a, dr- uh, for a dress rehearsal like at 7.30, 8 o'clock on Saturday night to test out things. And I wanted to give the character a little bit more life. And um, so I think, oh, God help me, I think Emily Latella was ranting about endangered feces, okay, I think, okay? And she's going, what are you going to do with it? Where are you going to keep it? What's it for? You know, what do you need this for? And then Jane said, oh, no, that's endangered species, and because oh, it's quite different, never mind. And it got its obligatory yeah. sort of applause, but I extended this beat a little bit. I gave Jane Curtin... Like basically this, uh, she scolded her and said, you know, you come on here every week and you get the, uh, the topic wrong <laughs> and, um, you, you undermine any journalistic credibility we have. You're an embarrassment to yourself. You're an embarrassment to us. I don't want to ever see you here again. Am I making myself clear? And, um, Gilda said, uh, crystal clear and then took a beat and under her breath said, bitch. Okay. Right. Now this was 19, I want to say 77. Okay, it might have even been earlier. And the censor, this big woman, 300 pounds, former nun, dress shields, you, you know who I'm talking <laughs> about. She came out of the, <laughs> she came out of the uh, control room and said to me, Alan, you can't do that when we go on the air. You can't do what? Um, I know that Lauren probably, probably had ultimately was the one who, um, you know, forced it through. But my experience with this was, I said, why, why can't we do this? And she says, you can't say bitch on television. And I thought for a second and I said, you know, when Gilda says bitch, she's actually using the adverb form of the word. I said, you know, in effect, she's saying, Jane, you are acting bitchy toward me. I've I've heard that before on TV. She's not saying, Jane, you are a bitch, which is a noun. And uh, I agree with you, should never be on television. <laughs> this, this is an adverb. And she took a beat and she said, um, yeah, you're right. And bitch got on TV. You know what I mean? So there, right. there was, like I said, I had no idea what Lauren did to push it through at his end. But we were able to deal with the senses ourselves and we were dealing with a mentality which was a network mentality that was beginning to change, you know? So it was, uh, in some ways, it was fun. In some ways it was more fun because you had to use a little bit of um, ingenuity to... You have to be creative to get out of the box. She yeah. bought this crock of shit. You know, I, mean, I, mean, she, she, I, I, I couldn't repeat it if you put a gun to my head. So, noun versus adverb, but she bought it and, and uh, it got on TV. And also, you know, coming from Gilda, it was a different thing than if I were to say it. You know what I mean? There was something about Gilda that was special. Well, she know? was sweet. Yeah. And she was sweet and she was vulnerable and um, there was a twinkle in the eye and there was something that let you in you know right. what i mean and it, it, it you, know, you know when she passed people were mourning and uh they felt they knew her even if they never met her before i was you know? i was one of those people um I, I i've told this story before that i went to a play that she was doing that was on heading towards broadway it was the one where she was at a beach house or something and uh, lunch hour Yes, lunch hour. With Sam Mike. Waterston? Yes. Uh-huh. And I went and saw it was in Delaware before it got sure. here. And just stared at Gilda for an hour and a half. And when I left there, I didn't know 
quite what the play was about, who else was in it. I just never took my eyes off Gilda, and that's how I felt about her. And then yeah. your your play, uh, Bunny Bunny, that you wrote was... Uh, well, it was about my relationship with her. It was based on a book that I had written with yeah. the same name, and there are actually a couple of producers now who would like to bring it to Broadway next year. So there. I'm I'm revisiting uh, it. I'm, I'm updating it just a little bit. Uh, when I wrote it originally, I was like, 43 44 mm -hmm. and um it was her death and her the relationship was still fresh in my mind now it's 20 some odd years later and uh i'm just going back a little bit to try to give it another little bit different perspective but that all being said she um i used to stand by the monitor you know and i used to see her in a crowd on tv and I couldn't take my eyes off of her. Yeah. You know, there are certain people. Belushi was the same way. Yeah. You just go and look, and you look at any of John's movies. You're just riveted. You know, I watched. Um, what was on a couple of nights ago? Blues Brothers. You know, uh, and, and he and Danny were great in it. You know, but any time I'd see John in the crowd when he was Blue Tarski in, in, yeah. in Animal House, you just your eye went immediately to him. Yeah. Became a massive movie star after being this TV star, which is hard to do, particularly back in those days. You were either in TV or movie. And Animal House came out, and he was maybe the biggest movie star in the country two or three weeks later. <laughs> well, Everybody was talking about it. Was it was massive, and you're absolutely right, because there was a distinction then. Yeah. I mean, I remember when um, uh, Candace Bergen, I think she had to read like seven times to get the role of Murphy Brown. Yeah. Okay, and she was a huge, huge star, a, a film star. Uh, when when they, when Animal House came out, what happened was like the next week or within the next couple of weeks, John was on the cover, I think, of Newsweek with a yes. toga. Yeah, and yeah, a yeah. It was, and it was like it was. Wait a second, there were not nobody else from the cast. Was mm -hmm. there, it was him alone. Everything else had been by and large group shots. Right. With the possible exception of Chevy, because yeah. Chevy was in one on Weekend Update when he was doing it. And um, the culture changed, you mm -hmm. know. And then and, and all of a sudden, th there came all those movies, you know, the ones that the animal, uh, that the uh, Lampoon guys wrote, you know, things right. like Caddyshack and Stripes and Harold Ramis's wonderful movies. And it just sprung everything open. Yeah. And you're in the middle of all that. It must have just felt like madness. It must have felt like... It was, you know, something what was fascinating about it. You know, a couple of years later, uh, Aykroyd asked me to co-write Dragnet with him. Okay, uh -huh. so I was living with Joe Friday for about three, four months, you mm -hmm. know. And um, because he'd get into the character and just speak like Jack Webb, you know. And I'm in the middle of it. And at the same time, it's all around me. And the fascinating thing about it, it was it, I didn't realize... I knew it was happening, and it was a movement, if you will. Mm -hmm. It was like the baby boomers, okay, it was our turn. Right. You know, SNL was the thing that was the wedge that opened everything, and then everybody else started creating things that had our generation sensibility, which, like you said mm -hmm. at the opening of this, would be a counter right. to the Alan Kings and those guys I wrote for in, in, in the Catskills. Um, it's only when I look back or more so when I look back, I can look at it academically. You know mm -hmm. what I mean? Because when you're in the middle of something, you're just doing whatever, <laughs> yeah. you know, but when you have a little bit of distance, you go, holy shit. Yeah, right. <laughs> wow. Yeah. <laughs> you know, and then the way people's careers grew and, uh, you know, and it keeps on going. I just look at SNL and, uh, you know, it's just, you know. Every time you think, okay, you know, this is all right, and then all of a sudden, Tina Fey comes along, or Adam Sandler, or Amy yeah. Poehler, Kate McKinnon, you know, look at these people. They're fantastic. The show just keeps going and going, and then they, when they leave the show, they go out into the, into the culture. They yeah. become Broadway stars, you know, Adam McKay won, a, won an Oscar last year, you yeah. know. I think that it's great how there always tends to be one person who comes forward and kind of tends to breathe new life into it just the happens. Cast. And then, I, I mean, I don't know if it's conscious, but then it seems like uh, once those one or two uh, standout 
type people, uh, you know, kind of emerge, it almost seems like the cast starts to become, uh, you know, suited for them, you know, like to to kind of support that writing as well. Yeah. And you're right. I I do think that, you know, every time there might be a season that you're like, this isn't maybe the best someone else. emerges. Uh, Yeah, it's because it reconstitutes itself. It's like anything else. You know, the seniors on your football team graduate and go to college. So, uh, okay, now the juniors come up, and uh, who's going to emerge right. from that? How's right. that going to work? And um, I just marvel at it. I mean, wa- I watch that show every week, and um, I'm just, you know, Cecily Strong. I mean, it just keeps on going. you got some really fantastic people. But if that was your only credit, it would to me it would be amazing. But your work in the 80s, the stuff that you did with Gary Shandling, with It's Gary Shandling's show, that show, every jaw had to drop watched. I mean, we'd never seen anything like that. That was, that was um, it was for me, having Gary as a writing partner, it was like lightning striking again, as it had done the first time with Gilda. Mm-hmm. Uh, he was a guy who, um, <laughs> you know, he... He made me laugh as much as anybody. I, I think he may have been one of the smartest guys I ever met. Uh, we both were, um, there was a, we were both, um, there was a degree of anarchy that the two of us had when it came to what was formulaic on TV. He had written for uh, Sanford. Sanford and Son, uh, Oh God, those kind of shows. There's right. another. I think Welcome back, Cotter. Welcome something. back, Cotter was yeah. the other one, so, which were good shows, but they were the norm. And the two of us, just like SNL, when we started it, was the um, anti-show, if, if you will, for lack of a better phrase, of the of the variety format. Okay. It's Gary Shandling's show became that for the sitcom format. We, uh, the fact that he spoke to camera was no big deal because George Burns had done it before. It had been done before. But what we did was we opened the whole thing up. I mean, he drove a car in the studio from one set to the other. You know, the, the audience was a part of the show. We, the, the conceit was that he lived in this apartment that happened to be on TV. So yeah. whoever came into the apartment, whether it was Tom Petty or, or Rob Reiner to do the dishes, you know, they were on television right now. And what Gary and I did was, um, you know, with, with SNL, it was like, okay, Carol Burnett show would do it this way. How are we going to do it? I uh, would, Gary and I would be, uh, all right, one day at a time. We do it this way. How are we going to do it? So it was even the theme song. We wrote a theme song together in an elevator. We were on a, uh, in a, uh, an upper floor of a building. We get onto the elevator, and Gary says, you know, we're going to need a theme song. And I go, all right, what should it be? He says, well, let's do a theme song about the theme song. So I said, what, what do you mean? And he said, well, and he starts sort of singing this is the theme to Gary's show. This is the theme to Gary's show. And I say, oh, Gary called me up and asked if I could write his theme song. <laughs> then he sings, it's all, I'm almost halfway finished. How do you like it so far? Then we both sing, how do you like the theme to Gary's show? Then I said, this is the theme to Gary's show. The opening theme to Gary's show. He said, this is the music that you hear when you watch the credits. <laughs> <laughs> then I said, I'm almost to the part where I start to whistle. <laughs> then we'll watch his Gary Shanling show. Then we both started whistling. And then we both said, this was the theme to Gary Shanling show. By the time we got to the lobby, when, you know, it's been a full day. Let's go home. <laughs> <Yeah>. Okay. <laughs> it was like 11 o'clock in the morning. So we just hit it off, you know. Um, but he was so smart. Um, I was, this was 86-ish, I want to say. I got a phone call from my manager, a man named Bernie Brillstein, uh, who, his, whose company also managed Gary. Mm-hmm. Brad Gray, who's now the president of Paramount Pictures, was a manager in the company, and his stable included guys like, who no one had ever heard of yet, Gary Shandling, Dana Carvey, John Lovitz, you know, um, Dennis Miller, it just, those guys, okay? Kevin Nealon. And, he had done what Bernie had done years before. Yes, yeah, so he found a, a whole kind of generation of guys. There you go. It was the yeah. next wave, yeah. if you will. And it became a fantastic partnership. 
Um, so Gary was represented by Brad, but it was all under the same umbrella. And Bernie called me and asked if um, I had, if I knew who Gary Shandling was. And I had seen him on Letterman or something like that. And I went, yeah, he's, I think he's really funny. He said, well, he was doing a, uh, a special for a Showtime. And they needed some fresh eyes. And they sent me the script. And I said, I, I think I could help. So they flew me out there, and I went right from the airport to whatever restaurant. I had dinner with Gary, and I thought he was a nice enough guy. And we said, okay, we'll, we'll, we'll keep talking. I go and I check into whatever hotel. Now I'm sleeping. It's 1 o'clock in the morning. It's like 4 o'clock for my body, right? Because I'd just flown in from New York. The phone rings in my room. Hello? Alan, it's Gary. I'm thinking, Gary, who? I mean, I'm just so disoriented. I go, oh, hey, man, what's happening? Alan, my dog's penis tastes bitter. You think it's his diet or what? <laughs> I called my wife. I said, I think I found the writing partner, you know? So, I mean, he just was that funny, yeah. you know? Funny, but did, was he also kind of troubled? It just always seemed like he had a tough time figuring out how to be. It was... It was a fascinating, um, he, he, he was this very, very interesting mess, okay? Mm -hmm. And I say that lovingly, he was real smart, and spiritually, he was far advanced of everyone. He was into crystals before anyone was. He had a, a, a cabin in Big Bear, uh, which I guess about 100 miles or so outside of L.A., where he used to go and meditate before anybody was doing it. And so in terms of his, spiritually, he was really evolved. Um, that said, uh, he was awkward socially, okay? Um, it was, uh, he had he had some difficulties with that. Things that, ordin you know, ordinarily would be, you know, human nature 101. You thank somebody, you, 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 you know, you, you, you're nice to them. You, 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 you. He, there were times where uh, he was difficult, you know, and um, I, when he passed, uh, I was asked to speak uh, at his, um, Judd Apatow asked me to speak at his memorial. So we went to LA and spoke and, most of the uh, speakers, in, in in very polite, but also very, it was interesting, it was troubling, because our, um, our relationships with Gary, a lot of us, myself very much included, were incomplete, in that um, after we finished doing our show, we did 72 episodes uh, over a four-year period of time, we were hardly speaking, and... Um, we we came back east for the summer. We had a home. We had a summer home in New Jersey. Lived in L.A., summered in New Jersey. <laughs> Figure that out, okay? Um, uh, we were back in Jersey, and my wife saw in the paper that Gary was appearing in Atlantic City, and she called him and said, I'm bringing Alan down, and I'm putting the two of you in a room, and you're not coming out until you're friends again. You've been through too much together. And that's indeed what happened. Um, but f through the years... I know that had I not been pursuant of him, you know, emails and mm -hmm. occasional phone calls, you know, uh, you look, I remembered his birthday. I, I, there's not a chance in hell he knew mine. Do, do you know what I mm -hmm. mean? There was a self-involvement there. And I don't, I don't believe for a second that it was malicious. I just think that he was caught within himself. And a lot of people, and, and what I had talked about, at the memorial, as did a few others, was that um, there was a closeness, then an estrangement, and then there was a road to reconciliation when he died. So depending upon how close you are to recon reconciling, you know, yeah. it hurt that much more or was that much more frustrating, you know? Well, I, I also think that's why some people get involved in spirituality is because the day-to-day -day stuff is hard to do. For some people. And I think of other friends of yours, like if you looked at a Billy Crystal, it's always seemed like Billy Crystal never had a wake. 
You know what I mean? He just seemed to know how to graciously move through life. And uh, Gary didn't get that. See, Billy has a wife that uh, was his first girlfriend. They mm -hmm. married about 45 years, something like that. He's got two great daughters. Um, he's got four. I think he's got four. Four terrific grandchildren. And, and that's his anchor. All right. He, um, the, the, you know, when we did 700 Sundays the first time, it could have run much, much longer on Broadway. It was selling out every single night and we could have kept going. He missed his grandchildren and they all live in LA. So he went back there. You know, he pulled the plug on the show. And when we came back the second time, it was a run up to, uh, did it for about 57 shows, I think, uh, before it was filmed as an HBO special. But Billy, has that he had the family uh he's got that companionship and he's grounded that way gary didn't have that mm -hmm. that gary didn't have that mechanism that component that said i need this or i can or, or to get that so therefore um he had uh a group of young writers who were his devotees. Um, uh, and he had a basketball game on Sunday afternoons out in L.A. that I used to play in. And, you know, Judd Apatow and Ed Solomon and uh, whoever was in town, Ben Stiller would play. And these were all people, if you'd speak to them, all right, uh, they feel they owed their writing careers to Gary. He became a mentor. He, he it was There was a certain amount of... Um, wisdom you know and um it, it it was like i said the uh the the dichotomy the contradiction was somebody who is able to dispense and we all know people like this wisdom okay have trouble doing it themselves for mm -hmm. themselves you know but there's a, a large contingent of writers sarah silverman i mean the people who spoke at his uh, memorial uh, it was pure love and pure gratitude for having Gary in their lives. Were you able to see that in the same young writers? Did you look at Apatow when he was young and say, okay, something? I didn't, you know, I met Judd. It was interesting. Um, when we moved from L.A. back to New Jersey, we were going through file cabinets, what to throw out and what to keep. And um, my wife came across this letter from this 15-year-old kid. And it was basically, dear Mr. Zweibel, thank you for coming out to my high school and being on my radio <laughs> show. And, and I don't know if I ever make it, I'm never going to figure. I give you sincerely, Judd Apatow. I'm going, holy shit. <laughs> Boy, I can get a few shekels for this letter, can't yeah. I? And, um, but I hadn't seen Judd's writing as a young kid. He came over to the apartment. And uh, I gave him phone numbers of people he can call and he can write to, you know, uh, write for. You know, I can Frank and, and Rodney Dangerfield and whatever. And, and that's how he introduced me at the memorial, the guy who opened up his phone book, you know. But um, I, Gar Gary was better at that than I was. Gary was able to look at something because I wasn't as critical as Gary. I, I set the bar lower. I'm thinking, okay, uh, there's a sense of humor here, but Gary was a craftsman about it, and um, uh, that was his specialty. Yeah, and he was totally dedicated when he was in that mode, That's right? absolutely right. He, was, he helped people with their drafts, with their rewrites. Uh, people like Judd would show him um, first cuts of movies, take his notes, and take them seriously. I know that I did the same thing. I, I, if I would do a pilot, I would show it to Gary, okay? And I'd say, what does it need, whether it was in script form or whether it was already shot? Um, I, bunny, bunny, I sent him the pages before I even had it published. And I remember he marked it in the, in the like a school marm. <laughs> in, in the margins, yeah. there were like X's and checks and little circles and, you know, see me. <laughs> <all> <laughs> That's amazing. Yeah, he was and, great that way. Uh, and particularly when it's such a personal, like Bunny Bunny is like probably your most personal work. I would think so, yeah. You've ever done. It gets clo It gets tougher to look at it, I guess, because you're so close to it. it, it that's absolutely right. You, you need somebody to look at it. Uh, you know, the, when I wrote Bunny Bunny, 
this was a tribute to Gilda that was inspired by my wife. She said, your, your, your friend died yet. You haven't cried yet. Just write something. Don't, don't, don't worry about what. And it wasn't meant to be published. I wrote it for myself as therapy. So I wrote it just pure dialogue. She talks, I talk. She, I wanted the words to touch each other. I, I one more time. I wanted. I relived the whole relationship from when we met all the way through a eulogy I gave at her memorial. It's best as I can. It's not like I was wearing a wire for right. fourteen years. Okay, so I just recreated it all, and. When I was done, it took about nine months. You know, it was a pad that was next to me on the passenger seat of the car. You know, it, it was written a lot at red lights. It was written a lot very early in the morning before I went to editing, let's say, of a show I was doing. And um, once I decided, okay, because I, I was encouraged to get it published, um, I showed it to Carl Reiner and Mel Brooks and uh, people who, Gary, <laughs> people who knew Gilda, people who knew me and Gilda, and they encouraged me to get it published. And once I made the decision, okay, we'll get it published. And once it was sold, an interesting thing happened. I now look at it and I'm putting on my editor's hat. That's when the distance sort of came in. I'm going, you know, we can use a better joke over here. Yeah, right. You know, we can take this and combine yeah. it with that. And I've had this vision of dying and going to heaven and Gilda's standing there at the gates with the book and going, come here, asshole. <laughs> yeah. this, this never happened. It, <laughs> what the fuck is this? <laughs> it's not journalism <laughs> now. Now we no. moved it. This isn't Woodward and, and Bernstein. <laughs> no. This is total uh, horseshit. Yeah. Um, always <laughs> fascinating to talk to you, buddy. And the next time, I hope that this gets a chance to come to. Oh, I hope so, too. Thank because you. That, that piece has stayed with me since That's I, so nice of you to say. I, I read it. And because, like I said, you were living that life that I, as a kid, I would have loved to have been with Gilda every day. I mean, it was it was literally a, a daydream. Um, you can also read uh, Alan's new book. For this, we left uh, Egypt. That's uh, March 7th. And we're going to look forward for Bunny Bunny. But let's do this again sometime. Oh, right? I'd love to. I love coming on your show. Okay. I love being here. You guys are great. All right. Um, that's it for us today. We'll see you all again in 1974. Ladies and gentlemen, the evening is over. We hope you all enjoyed yourselves, and we'll see you all again in 1974. Good evening! Yeah.